We Armenians have an important message for you. The media is not showing the full picture of climate change. What's really happening outside our windows? We Armenians are addressing all people of the planet. Climate disasters are rapidly increasing worldwide. The destructive power has grown exponentially. Scientists agree that we only have four to six years of relatively calm life left. Armenia, our country has already experienced a terrible catastrophe, the consequences of which we still feel today. Do we really want history to repeat itself? We know that this time it will be much worse and more terrifying. What awaits you? Despite the complexity of the situation, there is a solution. Everything depends on you. Don't miss it. September 13th, 2024. Kaleidoscope of Facts, Armenia Climate Threats. Organized by participants of Alatra International Public Movement. Greetings, dear friends. Have you ever heard the saying, every fruit has its season? The information you are about to hear today might seem irrelevant, but unfortunately, you will definitely come back to it in the near future. We, Armenians, have organized this conference because we believe it is necessary to address our compatriots and warn everyone about the climate challenges Armenia will face in the coming years. On November 2, 2021, at 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the fourth president of the Republic of Armenia, Armin Sarkissian, spoke about these issues. In his speech, he said, First, about Armenia, a small state, but a global nation. According to the World Bank analysis, Armenia is the fourth most vulnerable country to climate change in the Eastern Europe and Central Asia region. Armenia has registered a 1.3 degrees Celsius increase in temperature and a 9% decrease in precipitation. Environmental challenges do not recognize borders or conflict lines, and we must lead all the countries of the world to comprehensive cooperation. Everyone acknowledged one major issue, the existence of climate change. However, this is not the only problem we face these days, as we are also dealing with a pandemic economic difficulties worldwide, rising populism, uncertainty, and unpredictability. On the other hand, despite these problems, we recognize that there are trillions of dollars that can solve these issues. At the same time, thanks to hundreds of years of development based on quantum technologies and physics, we have made great achievements in science and technology. These technologies today can solve our problems, whether related to climate change, the coronavirus pandemic, or other issues we face. So, what is the challenge? Why are we not effective enough? I think we need to learn one thing from the history of science. 100 years ago, great scientists like Albert Einstein, Max Planck, and Heisenberg realized that the classical laws of physics and mechanics were not applicable to newly discovered elements and atoms. You have to change your mindset, philosophy, logic, even common sense to understand 
and create the theory of quantum physics. We are at a crossroads, and the world has become quantum. This is the crossroads from which we must start thinking differently, because the world before us is no longer the same as it was 10 or 20 years ago. If we change our mindset and shape our aspirations and strategy, we can effectively use the finances and wealth that the world has created during this phenomenal development and use these technologies to solve the problems we face. And we must not only solve problems, but also create a foundation for development for a better future. Finally, at the opening of this conference, Professor Brian Cox took us all into space to show us from above how beautiful this planet is and to realize that in the entire universe, this is our home, our only home. And we have no alternative but to work and fight for this green and blue planet. Armenia is determined to become a truly rational state, committed to our nature, planet, and humanity. And I am optimistic that we can overcome these difficulties and build a brighter future for all of us. Shifting the responsibility for solving all of society's problems onto politicians has long become a common occurrence. Unfortunately, in today's world, the number of climate, social, economic, and political issues has increased manifold. Politicians cannot keep up with addressing all these issues which essentially affect us directly. Saving the drowning is the work of the drowning themselves. Why are we so confident that someone else should improve our lives? Meanwhile, we typically stand aside from the problems and criticize those who attempt to solve them. People themselves need to take an active role in society and help politicians handle crises. UN resolutions aimed at improving societal life are created not just for politicians, but for us, the people. Therefore, it is our task to help implement them. Recently, we've noticed that the media does not present the full picture of climate changes. We have no idea what's happening right now, both in our country and around the world. We can once again blame the media for concealing information. Or we can take responsibility for our own lives and the life of society. Modern technical means allow every concerned individual to become the kind of journalist depicted in the journalistic code of ethics using phones, accessible technical tools, and social media. We can highlight the real events happening around the world by creating personal climate channels and public pages. Together we can see the full picture of the climate disasters occurring on our planet and draw the attention of politicians and scientists who can help solve these issues. That's why we want to begin our conference with an analysis of the climate and seismic threats in Armenia. This is the most important topic right now. After watching this segment, you'll understand why. Our broadcast today will consist of two parts. In the first part, we will learn about the climate threats our country has already faced, the causes behind these events, and what lies ahead. In the second part, we will discuss what we need to do to avoid a climate collapse. The events happening are a warning signal for all of us. The recent flood in northern Armenia alone 
claimed lives and caused significant damage. We spoke with people who were at the epicenter of these events. On May 26, 2024, Armenia was struck by a natural disaster. Heavy rains caused the Debd, Ogstev, and Tasha rivers to overflow, flooding the Lori and Tavush regions. At least 232 people were evacuated from the flood zones. Many roads and bridges were destroyed, and homes were flooded. The Debd River overflowed and caused destruction from the village of Dzorajit to the Bagratashan border checkpoint. On the 25th, we returned at midnight from our children's graduation party and went to bed. Then I was woken up by a phone call. My son's friend was calling and said that the water was sweeping away everything on its path, so wake up. And we live on the third floor. By the time we got ready and went outside, there was already a lot of water. In our area, there wasn't as much water yet. My son went to the station to help people. But within a few hours, the water reached our neighborhood and swept away the bridge. All we could do was stand by and watch. We have lived here for many years. But the Debd River had never overflowed to the extent that it reached residential areas. It was a terrible disaster. Then it became clear that the gas station, the hydroelectric power station, and all these supporting structures were collapsing. Well, it's obvious that this was a natural disaster. Did you expect such a disaster? No, of course not. We did not expect this. Nothing like this had ever happened before. The water had never risen to such a level. The water overflowed its banks and destroyed all these supporting structures right before our eyes. Naturally, we were all afraid. I think no one can claim that they will never find themselves in a similar situation. Anything can happen anywhere. We need to believe and take into account the opinion of scientists in order to avoid such situations in the future. To have people being taken down from the second and the third floors in boats, that had never happened before. In our building, all the neighbors moved to the third floor, and that's how we all waited together until the water receded. Previously, the water could rise to a maximum of 20 centimeters, but for the water to reach 6 meters, that's unheard of. Do you see the house on the other side? That's my friend's house. He just built it. This house was being torn down by water, the doors were jammed, and he had to open the windows to let the water out. There are sediments everywhere on the first floors. Everyone is still in shock. We go in and out of the destroyed houses, trying to understand what to do next. Of course, these are difficult experiences. You are in your home, and suddenly, water starts pouring in. We even had to break down a door with an axe to get a grandmother and her grandson out of there. During such heavy rains, we're usually warned to be cautious because the river might overflow. They even announce it on TV. But absolutely no one warned about such a flood. No, there was no any warning. We see floods and inundations in many countries. So no one is immune to finding themselves in a similar situation one day. Yes, we always see on TV that such disasters happen all over the world. We comforted ourselves that this would not happen in Armenia. But as it turned out, we had to face it too. At the Sanine station, the river's waters reached the second floors of buildings. Part of the main Tamanian Oliverdi Street was underwater. As a result of the flooding, land communication with the Debd region was interrupted. Significant damage was also caused to the settlements of Oktala and Karkop. Gas and electricity were turned off in Oliverdi, and internet and telephone services were disrupted. The river's waters washed away sheds, livestock, and vehicles. In Sanan, Oliverdi, 
and Iktala, people are simply in a stalemate. The railway is mostly destroyed. People become frightened when they see disasters happening across the country and around the world. We witness it firsthand and feel it on our own skin. Many were terrified as they watched what was happening from their balconies. Some saw the water carry away a truck and uproot trees. The water rose to levels it had never reached before. It was a terrifying event. I have lived here for 60 years, but we have never seen anything like this. Everything further away from this place was ruined. Thank God we were less affected. However, further away, Sanan and other settlements were all destroyed. What can I say? This is a catastrophe for our Armenia. There were significant losses, people suffered huge losses, the water carried away livestock, gardens and orchards, in which a lot of labor had been invested, were washed away. And today, we find ourselves in front of a broken trough. This is the first time we have seen something like this. A truck was blocked in the Aramalaverdi section. Two people were waiting for help on its roof. The National Crisis Management Center of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the Regional Crisis Management Center of the Lori Province received numerous reports of incidents caused by the Debd River overflowing its banks. In particular, a 50-meter section of the Vanadzaralaverdi road was destroyed. <laughs> It was at night when I got a call that the river had overflowed its banks and even washed away the road flooding the entire area. I immediately went to the Jaragat hydroelectric power station. When I arrived, the road in front of Tufankian was already destroyed, and I couldn't get closer. I had to walk along the railway tracks. When I reached the site, everything in front of the facility was also destroyed, and later, I found out that the water had washed away a truck from the area adjacent to Tufankian. The pedestrian bridge in front of the hydroelectric power station was also destroyed. The water flooded several houses in Aram Station and the town of Oliverdi. At the same time, a similar catastrophe occurred in the town of Tasher in the Lori region, where the river overflowed and inundated residential areas. Right now, it's exam time for the schools, and the kindergarten is also on that side, so a pedestrian crossing is absolutely necessary. There's no other way to cross the river further down, and if someone gets sick, it would be impossible to get them across. As you can see, everything is destroyed here, and it's unclear when everything will be rebuilt. As a result of the flooding, 16 settlements were left without water supply. International train service between Yerevan and Tbilisi was cancelled due to a landslide caused by the heavy rains. Various sections of the M6 highway were destroyed and became impassable. The towns of Oktala, Shamluk, Pokhar Aram, Metz Aram, Chachkin, Shno, and the village of Teget were cut off. There are four human casualties. One of them was a hydropower station worker, and the other three, unaware that the road was destroyed, fell into the river. On the first night of the catastrophe, it was difficult to mobilize state material and technical resources. Many people helped us. There were those who did rafting, and they provided their boats for evacuating people. Everyone helped in any way they could, using their personal vehicles and construction equipment. A big thanks to the young people. They came together and came to the rescue. There was water everywhere, and a lot of mud. The guys cleaned the houses, brought aid, and distributed it to the victims. Look at this. They managed to construct a pedestrian crossing somehow, and supplies and food are being sent over by cable car. At that time, a person died, and we had to transport the coffin by cable car too. The emergency services organized the crossing because the cemetery is on the other side. Another natural disaster occurred on August 12, 2024, around 2 a.m., when an earthquake of a 4.2 magnitude struck 9 kilometers northwest of Martyuni, Gegerkunik province. 
The focus was located at a depth of 10 kilometers, with the intensity of 5 to 6 at the epicenter. The earthquake was felt in the Gegerkunik province, Kotake province, and Yerevan. As of August 14, 82 buildings have been damaged as a result of the earthquake. The rescue service has received 120 calls from citizens. We don't believe in the severity and scale of ongoing climate catastrophes. Many people say that things have always been this way and that the climate isn't changing. But when we personally face a climate threat, we begin to understand that catastrophes of this magnitude have never occurred in our memory. As people become victims of climate catastrophes, they watch in fear and wait for help. We've seen that society isn't prepared for the climate threats which scientists predict will escalate rapidly. Staying in our current consumer-oriented and fragmented society, can we solve this problem? It is hard to see people who have found themselves in such situations. We live in the 21st century, with the capabilities and technologies to save lives. Yet, despite our progress, we are powerless against the forces of nature. Yes. Unexpectedly and mercilessly, nature invades our homes. Today, we are absolutely unprepared for the challenges that nature throws at us. Dear friends, to understand the scale of the threat, let's delve into what other destructive natural processes threaten our country. In 1993, the Republic of Armenia established the National Coordinating Council to implement activities within the framework of the International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction, IDNDR, designated by the UN International Community for 1990-1999. This council identified the following disasters threatening Armenia. Earthquakes. Earthquakes affect the entire territory. According to rich historical data spanning almost 2,000 years, the maximum earthquake intensity in the vast Armenian highlands reached 10 on the 12-point scale in the Yerzinka region. 70% of the country's territory lies in an 8-point earthquake zone, while 30% is in a 7-point zone. These earthquakes are associated with active deep faults and their intersection areas. Based on this, several zones in Armenia have high frequency and intensity of earthquakes. The major active faults in Armenia are the Garni, Pambaksevan, Zeltorechensk, Sarigamish, and Akurian faults. The Garni fault is notable for both seismic and high tectonic activity. Four major earthquakes are associated with this fault. In 906 in Vyotzor, in 1679, and 1827 in Garni, and in 1988 in Spitak. The total length of the Garni fault is 290 kilometers consisting of four sections. The total length of the Pambaksevan fault is 370 km, consisting of two sections, the Pambaksevan, western section of 260 km, and the Konarasar, eastern section of 110 km. This fault is associated with powerful earthquakes from the 5th to 6th millennium BC and the famous Ganzak earthquakes of 895, 915, 1139, 1308, 1407, 1931, and 1968. The Akurian Fault is 150 km long, with its 60 km section between the town of Digor and the Akurian Reservoir showing maximum seismic activity. There have been 26 earthquakes here in the past 950 years six of which led to catastrophic consequences. The Zeltorechensk Sarigamish Fault shows high tectonic and seismic activity. Its total length is 350 kilometers. 
strong earthquakes are spatially associated with its southwestern flank. In 1988, the catastrophic Spitak earthquake affected 30% to 40% of Armenia's territory. On December 27, 893, 1095 years before the Spitak events, the Divin earthquake, Divin city, Armenia, killed over 70,000 people. Some scientists estimate this number to be around 150,000 people with only 100 intact buildings remaining in the entire city. We present the trend of increasing earthquakes from 1990 to the present day. Data from the Volcano Discovery website. The highest number of earthquakes occurred in the cities of Gyumri, Vanadzor, and Yerevan. Landslides. Landslides in Armenia are widespread but they are most prevalent in the northern and southern regions, where fold-block mountain ranges extend. A total area of 34,679 hectares in Armenia is affected by landslides. The most affected areas are Vayats Zor, 11,816 hectares, Ararat, 8,334 hectares, and Tavush, 5,459 hectares. Landslide activity has been observed to increase since 1995. The cities of Delijan and Yerevan, as well as 230 villages of Armenia, located in landslide hazards, are most exposed to this danger. We will provide statistics on some incidents. 1989-1990 Landslide in Delijan, Vokchabird village, Kotaik region. 1993, landslide in Diligent. 1993, landslide in Dostakert village. 1993, landslide and collapse at the Sanahin railway station, Tumanyan region. 1990-1992, landslide in Yerevan. 1989-1990, landslide in Kachachkut village. Tumanyan region. 1993. Groundwater flooding in Aintap village, Massis region. In 2007, there were seven landslide incidents in Armenia, two of which were in Tavush and one in Lori. In 2008, there were five incidents with one in Lori. In 2009, there were nine incidents, three of which occurred in Tavush. In 2010, 19 landslide incidents were recorded, nine of which occurred in Tavush and six in Lori. In 2011, 10 incidents were registered, five of which occurred in Tavush and two in Lori. The annual damage from landslides in Armenia is approximately $30 million. Underflooding. Mesis region. Strong winds. Hail. Heavy snowfall. Frost. Forest fires. From 2001 to 2011, an average of seven forest fires were recorded annually. In 2010-2011, more than 50 forest fires were registered. The damage from forest fires between 2005-2010 amounted to 504 million drams. In 2006, the damage was 500.2 million drams. 
In 2012, 46 forest fires were recorded, burning 186 hectares of land. On August 12, 2017, two forest fires occurred simultaneously in Vyats Dzor region and the Khazarov Forest State Reserve in Ararat region, burning hundreds of hectares of green areas. On September 7, 2017, a forest fire devastated a large part of the Aragatsatan region, affecting up to 100 hectares of land. In 2018, 58 fires were recorded, burning 239 hectares of forest. In 2019, forest fires in Armenia flared up with renewed intensity. According to the head of the Ministry of Emergency Situations, they recorded 50 fires. 36 of which occurred in various grassy areas and territories adjacent to forests. A fire hazardous situation has developed in Armenia. Precipitation became more scarce in the forest areas, and in summer, temperatures increased. Flooding Karnat Reservoir Potential Dam Failures Akum Reservoir, Tavush Reservoir, Sarnakpur Reservoir, Mantesh Reservoir, Sovetashan Reservoir, Karnut Reservoir. Potential failures of regulatory devices on dams. Aripilich Reservoir, Vardakar Reservoir, Igedzor Reservoir. Unfortunately, comprehensive statistics on climate incidents in Armenia are not available to the general public. We've only shared the scientific data that is openly accessible. But even the information that is publicly available makes us consider the level of risk people are facing. This information is vital. By understanding what is happening, we can take measures to prevent disasters. Armenia's geographical location already suggests hazardous living conditions. Therefore, it is essential to know and consider these factors. There is another topic that deserves our attention. Let's agree. It's hard to find someone who remains indifferent when looking at our landscapes. The beauty is indescribable. But what influenced this geological formation? What lies behind this stunning view? Let's explore the topic of fault lines, which not only shape the appearance of our country, but also determine the seismic activity of the region. Armenia is located in the complex collision zone between the Eurasian and Arabian tectonic plates, situated in the central part of the Arabian lithospheric collision zone, a region of mountain formation. This region is unique in terms of tectonic activity. The tectonic faults running through the country are part of a larger system that shapes the geological structure of the Caucasus region. These faults not only determine the seismic activity of the area, but also influence its landscape, geological structure, and history. This region experiences compression from north to south and extension from east to west. 
leading to intense faulting, strong earthquakes with magnitudes of 7.5 to 7.7, and active volcanism. These earthquakes, along with tectonic creep, are accompanied by volcanism, landslides, ground deformation, cracks, hydrogeological changes, and landscape alterations. At the edges of the Arabian collision zone are the Anatolian and Iranian blocks. Due to the convergence of the Arabian and Eurasian plates, the Anatolian bloc is pushed westward, while the Iranian bloc is pushed eastward. The Arabian-Eurasian compression occurs at a rate of about 30 mm per year. Armenia is located in the central part of this collision zone. Let's consider three key structures that have the greatest impact on the region. pambak sevan shunik Fault, Armenia. Faults of the Ararat Valley, junction of the borders of Armenia, Turkey, Iran, and Azerbaijan. Gailatu, Balikgel, Sia Cheshme Khoi, and North Tabriz faults, junction of the borders of Iran and Turkey. In northern Armenia, eastern Turkey, and northwestern Iran, the faults form a north bending structural arc. The outer part of this arc is defined by two active faults the Jeltorachensk Saragamish Fault, ESF and the pambak sevan Sunik Fault. The pambak sevan Sunik Fault, PSSF, stretches 490 kilometers, extending southeast from Lake Arpi, northwestern Armenia, to the Arax Valley on the Armenia-Iran border. Of all the active structures in Armenia, this fault has the greatest length and slip rate and is associated with the strongest earthquakes. West of the junction of the Arpi Vanadzor and Vanadzor Artanish segments, the Pambak Sevan Shunik Fault Zone joins the Garni Active Fault, GF. At this junction, the Garni Fault forms a horsetail of multiple young ruptures. The westernmost of them is the surface rupture of the 1988 Spitak earthquake, with a magnitude of 7.1. The stepwise segments of the pambak sevan Sunik Fault Zone form the Vanadzor and Violet Depressions. The areas between the Garni and Arpi Vanadzor segments experience significant shortening, counterclockwise rotation, and are pushed in an east-southeast direction. Although there are many signs of young tectonic activity, there are no records of significant historical seismicity for the Vanadzor Depression and adjacent segments of the Pambak 7 Shunik Fault. The 1988 Spitak earthquake demonstrated that the duration of historical seismic records is insufficient for a reliable assessment of seismic hazards. Paleoseismological studies show that the Pambak 7 Shunik and Garni Faults despite having relatively low slip rates, 4 1.5 V matter a year, and long earthquake recurrence intervals, can still generate earthquakes with magnitudes of 7.2 to 7.4. In the center of the Vanadzor Basin lies the city of Vanadzor, as well as the large villages of Mehurut, Shaumyan, and Darbas. Approximately 183,000 people live in Vanadzor and the surrounding villages. The city of Vanadzor faces serious natural hazards from large landslides, some of which have recently shown creeping activity, shown in the picture as L1, L2, and L3. The scarps of all three landslides formed directly in the zone of the pambak Sone Fault segment, which borders the Vanadzor Depression to the south. In the western part of Vanadzor, there is a large chemical plant and a thermal power station. The high toxic waste storage facilities of the chemical fiber plant and the thermal power station are located above the city on the northwestern side of the Vanadzor Basin. The eastern bank of the ravine, under the head of Power Line 1, transmission line, is actively sliding. Additionally, 
Both dams were weakened by the 1988 Spitak earthquake and damaged in subsequent years. Scientists Karakanyan, Trifonov, et al. use computer modeling to calculate that surface rupture on the segments of the pambak sonik fault bordering the Vanadzor Basin is possible during earthquakes with magnitudes of 6.3 and 7.3. This could activate all three landslides, causing them to slide down. Landslides L1 and L2 would begin moving intensely under an earthquake with a strength of 0.3 g, m approximately 6.3, shifting down the slope by 120 to 122 centimeters at a speed of approximately 50 centimeters per second. An earthquake of magnitude 7.3 could cause a shift of 226 to 229 centimeters at a speed of approximately 90 centimeters per second. Within six seconds, the duration of the calculated earthquake, the landslides would rapidly and destructively move down the slope under seismic and gravitational forces, traveling a significant distance. The results show that an earthquake with a magnitude of 6.3 could also destroy the dams of the toxic waste storage facilities. This could lead to the simultaneous collapse of landslides L1 and L2 and dams TL1 and TL2. In this case, 20% of the city's population could perish. Another major fault network is the Ararat Depression, a large basin structure extending northwest with a width of 20-35 kilometers. The northeastern flank of the Ararat Fault is represented by the Sardara Parat Nakachevan Active Fault Zone, while the southwestern edge consists of the Dogubayazit and Maku Active Faults. Through the volcanoes of Greater and Lesser Ararat, as well as the Agridag Volcanic Ridge, runs a horsetail fault system, controlling the main centers of volcanic eruptions in Ararat and Agridag, forming a linear belt of volcanic cones. Historical and archaeological data indicate numerous natural disasters in the Ararat Depression. Earthquakes repeatedly destroyed Divin, the ancient capital of Armenia, claiming tens of thousands of lives and forcing the relocation of the capital. In the Ararat Depression, tectonic and possibly seismic activation of faults causes river channels to shift, contributing to hazardous natural phenomena. This is evident from the network of paleochannels of the Arix River, located in the central part of the Ararat Depression. The bends and shifts of these paleochannels confirm the right lateral displacement of the Sardara Parrot Fault, resulting in the Arax River shifting 12 kilometers to the south. Historical data help estimate the dates of such shifts. In ancient times, the Arax River flowed at the foot of Davtiblur Hill, where Armavir, the first capital of the Armenian Kingdom, was located. Other natural hazards in this region include volcanic activity and landslides. Archaeological evidence shows pyroclastic flows from Mount Ararat's eruption around 2500-2400 BC destroyed a settlement of the Kura Araxes culture. The most illustrative example of potential natural disaster danger in the Ararat Depression is the Ararat Earthquake of July 2, 1840, with a magnitude of 7.4. The earthquake triggered a volcanic eruption, landslides, lahars, pyroclastic flows, and acid rains. More than 10,000 people died as a result. Historical data show that the Ararat Depression is prone to natural disasters caused by a combination of different phenomena during strong earthquakes. As a result, due to various natural disasters, four ancient Armenian capitals located in the Ararat Depression were abandoned and relocated.
Armavir in 220 BC, Arshakavan in 368 AD, Artashat in 388 AD, and Devin in 893 AD. Interaction between neighboring active fault systems can further increase the risk associated with natural hazards. Therefore, an important fact for assessing seismic hazards is that the North Tabriz Fault, the North Mishu Fault, and the Gelatu Sia Cheshmekoi Fault are interconnected, forming a single North Tabriz Gelatu Fault system extending 550 kilometers. This fault system controls the main seismic hazard in northwestern Iran, southeastern Turkey, and parts of southern Armenia and Azerbaijan. The zone of strong seismic impact of this fault includes major cities like Maku, Hoy, Moran, Sufyan, and Tabriz in Iran, as well as numerous villages in northwestern Iran and southeastern Turkey, cities and villages in Nakhichevan, Azerbaijan, including Nakhichevan and Ordubad, and in Armenia, Artashat, Yerevan, Armavir, Metsamor, and others, fall into the zone of more moderate seismic impact. Historical data indicate that Tabriz, a city with a population of 1.2 million, faces the highest seismic hazard. It is one of the most seismically dangerous cities in the world, located on the eastern flank of the North Tabriz Gailatu Fault, where a strong earthquake is highly probable in the near future. Manifestations of geodynamic and seismic activity in this region are complex and still poorly understood. Many aspects of the geometry, kinematics, and displacement rates of these faults remain unclear, making seismic hazard assessments uncertain. An important fact to consider in seismic hazard assessment is the alternation of long periods of quiescence with sudden bursts of strong seismic activity, manifesting in clusters of earthquakes in time and space. A long pause in strong seismicity preceded the group of major earthquakes that migrated along the North Anatolian Fault in the 20th century. Similar patterns have been observed for individual faults in the central collision zone. In southern Armenia, for example, the Perikar Devin Fault, after a long period of quiescence, reactivated with a cluster of several powerful, magnitude 6.5 to 7.0, earthquakes over 42 years, from 851 to 893 AD. Each of these events leveled Divin, the ancient capital of Armenia. Since then, the fault has been quiet for 1,100 years, up to the present time. But this does not mean it will remain inactive forever. Seismic activation serves as a trigger mechanism for a series of interrelated natural disasters. The consequences of major landslides, volcanic eruptions, and other secondary natural phenomena during strong earthquakes can significantly increase damage and casualties, and therefore can substantially change the estimated level of seismic hazard. Powerful earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, landslides, soil impacts, floods, and river migrations combine to form a single complex of natural hazards. Each of these may not reach a dangerous level individually, 
but together they can cause a disaster. Therefore, it is important to study this interrelation and integration of natural disasters. This is especially true for the border zone at the junction of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Iran. Our knowledge on this matter is fragmented and limited. Comprehensive research requires cooperation among scientists from all countries bordering Armenia. Only then can we have a complete picture of the potential consequences of seismic impact on the faults in this region and proactively develop plans to minimize disaster consequences and save lives. The number of fault lines on our territory indicates that we have a high probability of large-scale earthquakes. In light of increasing seismic activity and earthquakes around the world, disaster could strike our home, Armenia, as it did several decades ago, but with even greater consequences. We know better than anyone how terrifying it is because our country has already experienced such a horrible catastrophe, the consequences of which we still feel today. Dear friends, especially for this conference, we have prepared a documentary film about the tragedy that our country's residents faced. We invite you to watch it with us. The most catastrophic event in Armenia. Every Armenian will say it was the Spitak earthquake. Witnesses of those terrible events remember everything down to the smallest details. As if it happened yesterday. Even now, when I try to remember what I saw there, it is not easy for me. It is very difficult. We went to Leninakan. A very terrible thing was already happening in the center of Leninakan. People were on the ground. We drove past the sewing factory. I still see corpses hanging from the windows. People probably didn't have time to jump out from the second or third floors. And then I remember when we all poured out onto the streets, I remember how the school building was swaying like in waves. And that's how we realized it was an earthquake. Because intuitively everyone was shouting, earthquake, earthquake. We were on the third floor of the Armenian Agricultural Institute, where I was studying. And that's where the earthquake hit us. The building shook very violently. We realized it was an earthquake and ran outside. A few hours later, we began to see intense traffic from Spitak. with cars honking loudly and calling for help. We went outside and managed to stop one car. The person inside was in a very shocked state, just shouting, help, help. Spitak is destroyed. We couldn't realize what was going on. On December 7th, 1988, a strong earthquake struck the northern regions of the Republic of Armenia, later known as the Spitak earthquake. The wave caused by the earthquake circled the earth twice and was recorded by seismic stations worldwide in Europe, Asia, America, and Australia. 
the tremors were also felt in Yerevan and Tbilisi. Then mom told us that Spitak didn't exist anymore, that Nalband had completely sunk into the ground, and that there were a huge number of victims in Leninakan. A series of aftershocks in just 30 seconds nearly destroyed the city of Spitak and caused severe damage to the cities of Leninakan, Kirovakan, and Stepanavan. At the epicenter of the earthquake in Spitak, the tremors reached to a magnitude of 10 in Leninakan, 9, and in Kirovakan, 8. We got into our car, me, my father, and three of our neighbors. And we drove at breakneck speed. I was behind the wheel. As soon as we arrived in Spitak, we saw for ourselves that we had entered a complete hell. There was a total... I can't even find the right words. It was total destruction of all buildings. We approached the city. And even in the scariest movies, I had never seen anything like it. It was... It shook not just me, but all of us. In less than a minute, multi-story apartment buildings turned into long mounds of rubble, burying over 10,000 people underneath. We saw individuals standing on the ruins, trying to clear the debris with their hands. We approached them and asked, how can we help you? What way? They were already exhausted. It had already been four to five hours since the earthquake, and people tried to clear the rubble with their bare hands in an attempt to save their children and relatives trapped under the collapsed buildings. We also tried to help in any way we could, but after a couple of hours, we realized it was absolutely futile. There was no equipment, no rescue workers. There was no one and nothing. The country was completely unprepared for a disaster of this magnitude. From Yerevan, coffins were being transported on open cargo platforms. And from Leninakan back, it was already a bloody mess. People without limbs. There were so many dead, so many injured people, and so many victims. There was no ambulance, no rescuers, and so on and so forth. It was a profound shock for me. I couldn't handle it. I don't think any normal person could endure such immense grief or remain unaffected by what had happened. At first, no one understood what was happening, but then it hit us that something extraordinary and terrifying had occurred and that our lives would never be the same. The initial warning of the impending disaster was a precursor to the earthquake, a foreshock that occurred on December 6th at 7.27 p.m., recorded by the seismographic station in Leninakan. This was followed by a less powerful seismic tremor. However, since earthquakes of three to four magnitude are fairly common in the area, the foreshocks did not raise alarm among the population or experts. Therefore, no precautionary measures were taken. If the residents had paid more attention to these warning signs and been aware of the potential risks, many lives could have been saved. Always remember, disasters and accidents are insidious. They happen where you least expect them and when you're least prepared. Three tremors occurred within 30 seconds. 
The main quake struck on December 7th at 11.41 a.m. local time, causing widespread destruction. It was immediately followed by another shock. The seismic wave once again rocked the area, further destabilizing structures already weakened by the first wave. A short time later, the third tremor hit. This wave toppled everything that had been weakened by the first two quakes, leaving behind a landscape of ruins and many vertical remnants of buildings. And there was a very strange sensation. It felt like standing on a giant tank, and it was as if a massive hammer was striking from beneath the ground, right under your feet. We even jumped up and down. These were probably aftershocks or something. I can't quite explain. But it was a powerful impact from below, accompanied by a deep, rumbling sound. It felt like some beast was trying to break free. from being trapped underground. Then, four minutes and 21 seconds later, an aftershock hit, nearly as strong as the main quake. It was this aftershock that finally destroyed the remaining buildings, burying thousands of people who hadn't managed to evacuate. Such repeated shaking acted like a saw, cutting and toppling vertical structures with each pass. The following waves broke down what, for some reason, the previous ones hadn't managed to handle. The energy from the bowels of the Earth surfaced in a nine-point magnitude spot measuring 20 by 40 kilometers, with a deadly 10-point magnitude ellipse in its center 6 by 16 kilometers in size. It struck directly under the city of Speedtalk, destroyed it like a megaton bomb almost to the ground, killing most inhabitants. The magnitude of the earthquake was equivalent to eight atomic bombs detonated in Hiroshima. So, if you didn't have to be in Armenia, you can imagine the extent of destruction. I traveled a lot. Just recently, I was in Spitak, Kirvakan, Leninakan, and Gugark. But I did not go to Stepanovan, and it truly feels like the situation is hopeless. Within a single day, there were nearly 10 earthquakes, ranging from 5 to 10 on the Richter scale. The damaged buildings were completely destroyed. Along with them, People who were not warned that aftershocks can be as dangerous as the initial earthquake also died. A building that appears intact on the outside may have many internal and invisible damages. It takes only a small tremor for it to collapse. When it all started, we began running outside. There was a huge crowd, and despite there being many exits from the school, Everyone was trying to get out through the main entrance. Our PE teacher tried to organize them, but it was no use. There was also a kindergarten nearby, and my little sister went there. The teachers led the other children out of the building and gathered them in a group. There was an open field nearby, but no one guessed to take them there instead of keeping them in that enclosed space, which could have collapsed at any moment. Unfortunate. All those students who died during the Spitak earthquake, and I saw this, died because they hadn't covered their faces with clothing. They suffocated. Nadzor. People died not because the buildings collapsed, but because the stairwells did. You shouldn't leave the building during an earthquake. I saw with my own eyes a cup of coffee on the table in one of the rooms in Vanadzor. It hadn't even tipped over. 
but 15 people died when they tried to go down the stairwell. And our mother told us that when it all happened, they let their students outside, but then brought them back in again. There needs to be lectures and training. In Japan, when a student comes to school, they have all the necessary items under their desk, ready to grab and run. In Armenia, these items are stored in one place, in one room. Imagine, during a tremor, every student runs to get their things, and it creates a huge crowd. I'll tell you more. If I am a scientist, or we, scientists, say that there will be an earthquake in 10 minutes, then there will be more victims than after the earthquake. The earthquake affected about 40% of the territory of the Republic of Armenia, where more than 1 million people lived. There were over 25,600 casualties. One third of Romania was destroyed. And 500,000 people were affected by the so-called aftermath of the earthquake. In total, we treated 260 to 270 patients at the Akalaki Hospital. And we operated on 30% of them. We couldn't save one Russian soldier. He had traumatic shock. Fractures in all his limbs and ribs, and a severe head injury. Then the most tragic cases began arriving. Children of various ages. A six-year-old came to us with intra-abdominal bleeding, and we operated on him. He was in a coma for 10 to 12 days, but eventually, he got better and was disconnected from the machine. When he regained consciousness, we started asking him his name in details. Then we realized the child had lost his parents. He stayed with us for almost two months. Our entire team and the local community took care of him. Feeding, clothing, and providing for him. We had a committee set up to find someone willing to adopt him. Almost three months later, a young couple arrived, saying their child was missing. They had been looking for him in all hospitals, all over Georgia, in Armenia. And they were told there were children in Akal Kalaki. It was true. I asked for the child's name. And as soon as they said it, I understood it was that very child. Three months pass, and you can imagine the rest. The entire world came to the aid of the Armenian people. Rescue efforts saw active participation from representatives of France, Greece, the USA, England, Canada, Australia, Italy, Algeria, and Yugoslavia, Poland, and other countries. A total number of 417 doctors from 17 countries arrived in the disaster zone. In the initial minutes and hours after the tragedy, neighboring Georgia quickly sent help with food and clothing. They dispatched 25 ambulances with medical teams to the disaster area. So the first thing that came to mind was to assemble a medical team, leave immediately, and head to Leninakan, and we set off. When we arrived at the center, nowadays it's the main square of Gitomri, and we encountered a scene of overwhelming devastation. There were many corpses, countless injured people, and a cacophony of screaming, noise, and crying. People were desperately searching for each other. We provided first aid, but it became clear that significant help couldn't be provided on site. 
It was clear that people needed doctors' hands, but I understood that the mass of injured and incoming people required qualified surgical and trauma medical care, and it was obvious that full assistance couldn't be provided on the spot. We returned and brought about 12 injured people with us on the first trip, using two vehicles. Upon reaching Akau Kalaki, we set up additional beds. At that time, our hospital had 160 beds. We cleared out all departments, discharged as many of our own patients as possible, and prepared to receive the new injured people. Hundreds of pilots from various countries completed over 900 flights, delivering essential supplies and humanitarian aid. Over a hundred countries were involved. We helped with the distribution of aid. Foreign rescuers arrived on five planes. In general, there were several hundred people from the USA, Israel, Austria, Italy, and France. The French were clearing the rubble of the school in Lenanakan. When their surgeon lifted a slab, he saw children lying there with their eyes open. He died of a broken heart. The survivors needed not only emergency medical care, such as surgery and blood transfusions, but also psychological support. This was especially crucial for children and those who had lost family and loved ones. I encountered many visitors who had lost their mothers right after the earthquake. One girl didn't speak at all, but when she did, it was only about losing her mother. That was the only topic. What did the elderly and children, especially those who lost loved ones during the earthquake, share about their experiences? Stories from those who were injured or left alone. What happened to the traditional Armenian family that lost its members? The disaster struck little Galist while he was sitting at his school desk. It was during a lesson in the third grade at Leninakan School Number 10 when the earthquake reduced the building to rubble like a house of cards. He recalls these moments in fragments as the events were so sudden and shocking. Almost all my memories start from when we were pulled out from under the rubble. I was trapped for more than two days with my entire class. Before we were buried, I remember our teacher running toward us trying to shield some of my classmates from the falling walls and ceiling with her body. But she was just seconds too late. In an instant, we all fell down and were covered by panels and construction debris. I managed to grab the hand of my classmate, Tagui. For those endless two days, she was the only person whose presence I could feel. I remember when a rescuer reached me and began pulling me up. Tagui and I had been holding hands the whole time. But when Mikhail, the rescuer, was pulling me out, my grip loosened. Tagui stayed behind. The rescuers worked tirelessly. After several more hours, they managed to carefully break apart the slab blocking the girl's path to freedom. The structure didn't collapse, and Tagui was rescued. At that moment, she, like me, didn't understand what was happening. The gathered people passed us along towards the tent and the fire. There, we continued to wait for our families, to find us and for the other classmates to be pulled out. Rescue operations continued without pause. Every day we returned to, to that spot, hoping to see the remaining kids and our teacher. It never happened. Thousands of people, rescuers, doctors, scientists, lawmakers, ministers, government leaders, artists, cultural workers, student and school children pitched in to help in any way they could. At that time, all the Soviet republics were mobilizing their resources, people, equipment and materials doing everything they could to save Armenia. And then, there's a well-known story of a little girl from San Francisco who sent her savings, which she had saved for breakfast, to help the earthquake victims. A girl from Moscow, Yulia, 
whom I spoke with said, when this tragedy happened, I sent two rubles that I collected. I believe this is worth more than many millions, because it comes from the heart, from a child's heart. It is the soul of the future, already filled with kindness rather than cruelty. I believe that the most important weapon a person has is goodness, love, and compassion. A human cannot be happy if their neighbor child has died. They can't be happy if they're humans. Back then, we were just school children, so what we could do? Each of us brought from home whatever we had. Warm clothes, candles, anything that could help people. We collected these items in boxes at school and sent them off to the aid centers, which were set up to gather donations. Our parents even sent their monthly salaries, I remember. Times were tough for us too in 1988, but no one was focused on that. Everyone helped out in whatever way they could. Ordinary people, absolutely everyone. People saw that regardless of age, social status or position, everyone approached the situation with compassion and powerful determination. Each person did everything they could to alleviate the suffering caused by the disaster. This force was stronger than the magnitude of the earthquake. It was a strength of mercy and compassion. Armenia received a large amount of aid, including blood for transfusions, food, clothing, medicine, medical equipment, communication tools, tents, small shelters, and technological equipment. And yes, thank God the help did arrive. The entire world, the whole planet, came to Armenia's aid. The Spitek earthquake contributed to the fall of the Iron Curtain. It shattered the image of a German soldier with a machine gun killing people. From then on, we saw the image of a German who, with tears in his eyes, was clearing rubble and helping the victims. And the expression in our language, sub tanim, I will take your pain upon myself, took on its most literal meaning during those days. People tried to shoulder the pain of others. It doesn't matter what your nationality is, Armenian, Colombian, or Polish. All our efforts should be focused on solving this problem. In just a few days, 50,000 tents and 60 field kitchens were set up for the victims, along with about 10,000 hospital beds where over 6,000 doctors worked. From the disaster zone, 40,000 people were evacuated to Georgia, Crimea, the Stavropol region, and Kuban. Hundreds of children and injured received medical care in hospitals in the USA, Italy, France, Germany, and other countries. For the reconstruction efforts, 45,000 builders came to Armenia. Our people have old and great wisdom. When we bless someone, we say, may your house be built. When the construction had already begun, the people seemed to have calmed down. As a result of the earthquake, more than half a million people were left homeless. This led to an urgent effort to build temporary housing. In Speed Talk, there are Italian, Swiss, German, Uzbek, and Turkish neighborhoods, named after the countries that helped with its construction. You might be surprised to learn that even more than 30 years, people are still living in these temporary shelters. Many people returned and continued to live, create, and build. We saw the cities of Leninakan and Gimri grow and began to be rebuilt. Unfortunately, the Soviet Union later collapsed and construction couldn't be completed. There are still unfinished buildings there. Now the Republic of Armenia is continuing the reconstruction. Can you imagine the lasting impact? As Armenians, we know all too well that 36 years have passed and many people are still living in temporary homes. Sadly, many have still not received the support they need. Despite significant international support, the Spitak earthquake revealed our society's unpreparedness for natural disasters, both at the governmental level and among the general public. 
During the Spitak earthquake, all Armenians who had relatives in the area rushed towards Spitak, blocking all roads for ambulances and fire trucks. It was a nightmare. People were dying because help couldn't get through. In the schools, all secondary exits and windows were boarded up. It was a disaster, you see. All these emergency exits were blocked with junk, old furniture boards, and construction debris. For three days, people in the villages were dying because there was no information about what was happening there. Everyone rushed to the cities of Kimri, Sepanapan, and Banadzor. No one knew what was going on nearby. We need to educate everyone on how to act in any unexpected situation. So what should we do? Can we come back to what was mentioned earlier? Maximize the preparedness of the population. Make them as informed and as skilled as possible. The primary task for a rescuer is to minimize their workload or delegate their responsibilities as much as possible at the lower levels down to ordinary people. What kind of people? Those who find themselves in the situation and, if they're capable, if they know how to provide first aid and assess the situation, would understand what has happened. What should an ordinary person do? Imagine yourself, or at least any one of us. If something happens to you at that moment, who will you help? If you're at home, you'll help your family. If you're at work, you will assist your colleagues. If you're on the road, you will help those you always come into contact with. In a way, first aid is a somewhat selfish act. You're always helping those close to you. Why not take the time to learn first aid? All you need to remember is to maintain three vital functions, consciousness, circulation, and breathing. If you keep these three vital functions intact until help arrives, the rescuer, doctor, or professional will be working with a survivor in need of help rather than a body or someone close to death. You should prepare a family emergency kit, which includes copies of your documents, two bottles of water, and two chocolate bars. Also, include a first aid kit and waterproof clothing. Keep it by the door so you can quickly grab it and leave it in the event of disaster. As for where to go during an earthquake, up, down, etc. Thankfully, there are guidelines created during the existence of Ministry of Emergency Situations, which continue to be refined. You can download them from the Crisis Management Academy's website. They're available. All it takes is willingness to learn. The assessment of the earthquake threat for the seismically active area of Spitak, as well as for all of Armenia and the Caucasus region, was clearly underestimated due to insufficient study of active fault lines. After the Spitak earthquake in 88, when we conducted a survey in Gennari and asked, what natural events are you most afraid of? No one mentioned earthquakes. Can you believe that? Seismic studies in Armenia largely relied on current instrumental data and 
to a lesser extent, on historical earthquake catalogs. Information from Armenian historical records was often ignored because it was believed that authors had exaggerated the scale of damage and the number of casualties from earthquakes. As a result, seismic risks were not considered in the development of building codes, which led to difficulties accessing rescue sites and limitations in using rescue equipment, as building debris blocked roads. Inadequate risk assessment and lack of necessary research resulted in unpreparedness and a high number of casualties, which was further compounded by the population's lack of readiness for such disasters. Here's a simple truth. It's not earthquakes that kill people, but buildings and the ensuing crush kill people. Schools don't teach anything about this, and people aren't prepared for disasters. They're definitely not ready. If something like this were to happen in Armenia again, God forbid, I think it would be just as bad, if not worse. I'll tell you something else. In Yerevan, you've probably seen gas stations right next to buildings or even on pedestrian walkways. It's a disaster, you know? Oh, here's another thing. Near Iran, all the buildings are packed together. If an earthquake happens, no crane or equipment will be able to reach those buildings to rescue people from the rubble. It simply won't be possible. It will be a crime to allow such a thing to happen again, not to warn, or be ready to make some inventions that would at least give a hint, at least evacuate some in time, or at least do something. Well, at least try to do so, because that wasn't available in Lenin again. We scientists know all the active faults in the Caucasus. We know them by segments and potentials. But we don't know when it's going to happen. You know, when women cook porridge, bubbles appear. We know that these bubbles will appear. But no one knows where and when they will appear. That's the case here. We need to prepare for a strong earthquake. It will happen. If the earthquake occurs in the desert, well, it happens, that's all. But if it happens like the Spitak earthquake, and if it had happened near Yerevan, the number of deaths would have been not 25,000, but 125,000. We don't tell many people this, but according to our data, if the earthquake happens on our main fault near Yerevan, 10 kilometers away, the number of deaths will be over 250,000. And in a city like Bonanzor, it will be just horrific. According to modern seismic risk maps, Armenia's entire territory is in a seismic risk zone of 8 to 9 points on a 12-point scale. There are many such zones on the globe. However, some countries such as Japan or Taiwan have found ways to live relatively safely in these areas. 25 years ago, in 1999, there was a devastating earthquake in Taiwan with a magnitude of 7.6. At that time, 2,400 people died and over 50,000 buildings were damaged. Since then, seismic resistance standards have been raised and new building technologies have been developed. When an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.4 occurred on April 3rd, 2024, the number of casualties was 16 people who died due to landslides but were not killed by buildings. The power of this earthquake is compared to the power of 32 atomic bombs. However, seismic reinforcement of buildings costs enormous amounts of money. Can Armenia solve this issue on its own, especially when the consequences of that terrible earthquake have not yet been eliminated? 
The answer is obvious. Additionally, people themselves do not realize the danger they are in and do not want to study the problem. In Japan, however, when buying or renting real estate, the primary concern is the safety of the housing, not proximity to the subway or the view from the window, but what magnitude the building can withstand in the event of an earthquake. This is a clear example of forming public demand. And now, I'm getting to what you probably expected, that the state, government, or relevant authority would somehow warn you in advance about an earthquake. This will not happen. So, are we left with only packing an emergency kit and hoping that if an earthquake occurs, the building will survive or that somehow we will miraculously stay alive? Let's start by formulating the goal. Any rescue system or system that needs to be prepared for emergencies to mitigate and manage them should have the sole purpose of reducing the consequences of natural disasters. The hypothesis about possible human influence on seismic activity was first put forward by Indian scientists Narain and Gupta. They noted that after construction of the Koina Dam in India in 1962 and the filling of the reservoir, an increase in seismic activity in this area began to be noted as early as 1963. At that time, scientists understood that this was technogenic seismic activity related to the pressure of the water mass on the Earth's crust. Since then, the topic of artificial impact on the Earth's crust has become quite popular among scientists worldwide. After many years of observations and experiments, Experiments, the answer is clear, yes. Instead of one powerful earthquake, various interventions on the Earth's crust can result in a swarm of small, insignificant earthquakes that do not lead to destructive consequences. However, this topic has still not been sufficiently studied. And because the faults of the Earth's crust don't have boundaries, close international scientific cooperation is necessary. To achieve this, people themselves must show an interest in this issue. After all, the future of their children depends entirely on people themselves. Only people themselves can create a demand for establishing a scientific center to study climate issues. Although it is not in Armenia, what is happening now is much scarier than what happened in Spitak. I observe what is happening in different countries that are experiencing these terrible cataclysms. Earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, tornadoes. And they simply do not receive any help. It is very hard to see what is going on now. I feel very sorry for the people who lost their lives, but what can we do? We should speak about it and make sure that everyone knows that even the most powerful country in the world cannot handle a disaster alone. A prime example is the aid provided to Armenia during the Spatak earthquake. Even after 30 years, the problems that accumulated from that terrible earthquake have not been fully resolved. But Armenia received help from over 100 countries. The fact that people have been dying then and now speaks for itself. The fact that many regions affected now cannot even receive help goes beyond all limits. For example, earthquakes have struck Syria and Turkey. Turkey received some assistance, but the Syrians received no help at all. 
And what can we do? We can only regret that we have such a society. Our tragedy is that we can remain indifferent to what is happening nearby. This is the tragedy of today's society. Today, climate disasters occur all over the world. Their frequency and intensity have sharply increased since the end of the last century. They will not stop on their own. The dynamics of their development indicate that this process will not only continue, but will actually accelerate. In the future, if we do not address the climate issue, we will face earthquakes of a magnitude that humanity has never experienced before. I also recently noticed how frequently these disasters and cataclysms occur. All of them indicate that if you do not learn the lesson today and unite our forces from the individual level to the state level, we will not only end up with a broken trial, but will also lie dead next to this broken trial. Unfortunately, these are kinds of problems that can no longer be solved by the will of an individual. Unfortunately, that bell has already rung. The increasing frequency of catastrophes indicate that we have opened Pandora's box with our actions. You can already see the number of catastrophes, their consequences, and everything else. Don't wait for it to happen tomorrow and then react. Prepare today. Everything is very easy to calculate. Everything is realistic and tangible. The low level of safety, the activation of the Earth's interior, and climate changes. This is the fact. Starting today, learn about the risks that exist. Let's begin working in this direction. At the individual level, at home, starting with the upbringing of children and continuing with the family, community, city, country, and the entire planet. We must start with communities because the strength and competence of individual citizens determine the strength of the state. I wish everyone to set aside their ambitions and insinuations and unite. Because whatever we achieve in this world right now will not matter because we will no longer be here. These cataclysms are gaining strength and will get worse. And to save ourselves and our children first and foremost, we need to give our scientists a chance. We need to give a chance for a new civilization to emerge. We must use all our resources to help scientists save this planet. As long as we are divided, nothing will work. We need to unite around this climate issue and solve it. We, the ordinary people, must unite because governments and the powerful of this world will hold on to their ambitions and power until the very end, no matter the cost, until the last second. Addressing the climate change problem requires a comprehensive approach and the involvement of high-level specialists, such as seismologists, climatologists, oceanologists, geologists, physicists, astrophysicists, and so on. But do they know that humanity desperately needs their help? No. Why? Because we, the people, turn away from solving this problem. For the governments of countries to release their scientists, they need a request from us, from each of us. A request for the creation of the Unified Scientific Center. We have huge resources, including human ones. And it is precisely the professionals in this field who must take a responsible position in the fate of all humanity. 
Today, we must care about the fate of our neighbor. We must first be informed, protect ourselves, and have faith to save humanity. We have brilliant scientists who are specialists in this field. And I believe they should propose solutions to this problem. Our academy has enormous resources and potential. And we must not dissipate these resources on insignificant topics. We need to strengthen this public demand as the existence of such scientific centers is already necessary to ensure that the response to upcoming situations is not spontaneous, but coordinated through various scientific models. If we want to live, if we want our children to live, we need to stop all conflicts, wars and disputes. We must unite against the main enemy of all humanity, the climate Cerberus. Each of us, whether an official or a citizen, must do everything possible to avoid emergencies. Let's start with ourselves, each of us, in our home, in our community, in our environment. If you're safe, your family is safe, your community is safe, then it is very easy to ensure the safety of your country. And a safe country can ensure the safety of the entire planet. This planet is a very tiny ball. Do not think that if it happens there, it will not happen here. No, these are no longer the old centuries. Everything spreads quickly. We need to set one goal for ourselves. It is our unity. Our people have tremendous potential, and we're destined to have a powerful future. I believe in this, but I want to see it with my own eyes. And so I'm doing everything today to make it happen. God forbid such a thing ever happens again. Friends, we showed this video not to scare you. There is a saying, understanding the past means learning to overcome the dangers of the future. As stated in the documentary, to ensure such a tragedy never happens again, we must take all possible measures, and we have all the resources to do so scientific, technical, financial, and intellectual. The one issue we must solve, and we can only do it together, is to foster the unification of scientific potential to address the problem of climate change. When studying climate issues, we need to take a comprehensive approach from multiple angles because all processes on the planet are interconnected. The climate issue is much broader than we currently imagine. For instance, few people consider that rising atmospheric temperatures, ocean warming, earthquakes, and volcanic activity are all connected. And as we know, Armenia is a country of volcanoes. Yes, it's easy to dismiss this fact by saying, they're all dormant. But, while preparing for this episode, we found information we simply cannot ignore or keep silent about. After all, few have seriously considered just how many volcanoes are in our territory. And what do we really know about them? The Armenian highlands is one of the most volcanically active regions in the world. Located in the seismically active Alpine Himalayan zone between the Anatolian and Iranian plateaus, the Armenian highlands are about 500-700 meters higher than the surrounding plateaus and are bordered by mountains. That's why it's often referred to as a mountain island. The region consists of fragmented mountain ranges, young volcanic masses, and plateaus. All of Armenia's terrain, 
was shaped during the most recent volcanic era. And every mountain peak in Armenia is actually a dormant volcano. When we think of a volcano, we often picture a fiery mountain with a crater in the center that leads straight into the depths of the earth, occasionally spewing gas, ash, molten rocks, and lava flows. But not all volcanoes look like this. In the Armenian highlands, 550 mountain peaks have typical volcanic domes, while the rest appear as ordinary mountains. When scientists analyzed the spatial density of volcanoes in the Armenian highlands, they found that the northeastern part of the region has one of the highest concentrations of volcanoes on Earth. For example, in the northwest part of the Gegem Highlands lies the Yeratumber Volcanic Group. These are 19 volcanoes located compactly onto an area measuring 12 by 6 kilometers. Many of the volcanoes in the Armenian highlands had powerful eruptions up until the beginning of the Holocene, about 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. In geological terms, this is quite recent. According to the widely accepted agreement, an active volcano is defined as one that has erupted within the last 10,000 years. It is believed that in this case, the volcano to be dormant rather than extinct with a significant chance of future eruptions. Therefore, studying the behavior of volcanoes in this region is particularly important. In reality, historical volcanic activity during the Holocene in Armenia and the surrounding regions of Turkey and Iran is much more widespread than it is commonly believed. And it can be considered a natural risk factor for these areas. The memory of some of the eruptions is preserved in the names of many modern volcanoes in Armenia and eastern Turkey. For example, in Armenian, Tskuk means smoking, Karkar means thundering, Porak means belly, and Vyots Sar means mountain of misfortune cries, Tondarek means underground oven for baking bread, Ajdahak means dragon, and Nemrut means grim or evil. Legend of Nemrut. According to legend, King Nemrut started building a massive fortress on the mountain of the same name, reaching up to the heavens. Seeing this audacious plan, God sent a terrible storm, created an earthquake, and destroyed the fortress. One of the fortress's stones flew all the way to Urfa, raising so much dust upon landing that it darkened the city's light. Even today, in the gorge near the village of Datvan, you can see petrified camels carrying stones and sand, and the sullen, unsmiling people in the region are still called Nemrut Nemrut. Volcanism in this part of the world has a number of specific characteristics. First of all, it is the proximity of its areas to certain tectonic zones of extension, to faults of the Earth's crust. This can be explained by the fact that various geodynamic transformations associated with shifts in the Earth's crust cause partial melting in the crust or upper mantle. Combined with the increased permeability of the crust, this leads to the rise of magma to the surface and the occurrence of volcanic eruptions. Across Armenia, there are hundreds of quaternary vents and fissures formed in ridges and plateaus associated with faults. These include the Javakiti Range extending deep into Georgia, the Gegem Range directly overlapping the Garni Fault, and the Porak and Karkar volcanoes located on the Siunik Fault, which extends south of Lake Sevan. The stratovolcano Aragats is situated in the central part of the tectonic arc, formed between the Akurian Fault and the segments of the Zheltorichensk Sarikamas Garni and Pambak Sevan Siunik Faults. Meanwhile, the Ararat Volcanic Massif is aligned with the axial part of the Ararat Basin, which is a major volcanic tectonic structure. The high permeability of the Earth's crust in these zones creates favorable conditions for volcanic activity. This is especially characteristic of the central part of the Siunik Volcanic Highland, the Gegem Highland Volcano Ararat and Volcano Aragats. Tskuk Karkar Volcano the last volcanic activity of the Tskuk Karkar volcano about 4,000 years ago is connected with magmatic activity on the Syunik Fault. The volcano is located on the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Its summit is at an elevation of 11,762 feet above sea level. The last eruption occurred in the 3,000 years BC. 
People living on the highlands between Lake Sivan and Karkar during the late Paleolithic to early Bronze Age would have witnessed volcanic activity and seismic events related to the emergence of new vents and fissures. Lava fountains and the formation of cinder cones would have been visible for many kilometers around and were likely accompanied by moderate earthquakes. Petroglyphs found in the area provide evidence of this activity. Between Mount Karkar and Mount Porak, a petroglyph was found estimated to date back to the 5th millennium BCE, 6,000-7,000 years ago. Scientists believe that the petroglyph depicts a Strombolian eruption of the volcano, as suggested by the characteristic cone shape. The small round elements above and to the right of the cone resemble volcanic bombs. This type of volcanic eruption is characterized by the expulsion of rock fragments, ash and lava fountains reaching hundreds of meters in height. Stromboli Volcano on the Aeolian Islands of Italy is a clear example of this type of eruption. The emergence of the Porak Volcanic Group is also linked to activity along the Pambak 7 Siunik Fault. There are historical records of eruptions of the Porak Volcano. The famous Korkor cuneiform inscription, belonging to King Argishti I, was found near Lake Van. The inscription recounts a victorious military campaign to the north, into the territory of modern-day Armenia. One of the inscriptions reads as follows. When I besieged the city of Bahura again for the second time, Mount Bamni in the area of the city of Bahura was destroyed. Smoke and soot now rise from it to the sun. When Mount Bamni was destroyed, I took the city of Bahura. Historians believe that Argishti Thurn's northern campaign took place between 782 and 773 BC, and they suggest that the ancient town, along with other settlements and fortifications found in the Sivan Lake Basin and the Vardanus Volcanic Range, are remnants of Bahura, while the Porak Volcanic Group corresponds to the mountain of Bamni. The Volcanoes of the Gegum Range only 127 of them have pronounced volcanic domes, are also an important part of Armenia's volcanic heritage and are also controlled by faults. Analysis has revealed three clusters of linearly arranged volcanoes in the corresponding extension zones. The western Razdan cluster includes 14 volcanoes. The largest are Gutansar, Athis, Fontaine, Alapars, Avazan, and Gumush. The central cluster comprises 54 major volcanoes. The largest ones are Bogasar, Metztslugluk, Sevkar, Ajdak, Armagan, and Spitaksar. The eastern cluster has 30 volcanoes. The most significant are Karapetyan, Jirbashian, Gambarian, and Vagramasar. The northern part of the Gegham volcanic highland is characterized by prolonged volcanic activity from the Pliocene to the Neolithic with a shallow volcanic hearth, 1.5 to 1.9 miles deep. The volcanoes of the Gegum Range, especially its central and eastern clusters, are areas of Holocene historical aerial volcanic eruptions. GPS observations conducted in Armenia by Montpellier, Two University, Georisk, and the Institute of Geological Sciences of the National Academy of Sciences indicate the highest fault slip rates in Armenia. Recorded for the western and central clusters of the Gegum Range at 635 to 7 millimeters per year. This high rate of stretching in the linear clusters of volcanoes controlled by faults suggests a high likelihood of future volcanic eruptions in the Gegum Range, according to scientists. Aragats is the highest mountain in modern Armenia. It has four peaks, with the highest being the northern one at 13,419 feet. The volcano forms a cone with a perimeter of up to 124 miles. Between the peaks lies a volcanic crater that is 1,148 feet deep and 1.55 miles wide. According to Armenian volcanologist Karakanyan, the youngest cones of the volcano, located at its lower part, formed 3,000 years ago. The area of extrusive and effusive centers of activity covers about 27 square miles, 
indicating a large volume of the peripheral volcanic focus and its shallow depth of about 1.9, 2.5 miles or less. Mount Aragats is a stratovolcano, also known as a composite volcano. This type of volcano has a conical shape and is composed of multiple layers of hardened lava, tephra, and volcanic ash. Stratovolcanoes are characterized by their tall, steep shape and periodic explosive eruptions. In such volcanoes, magma solidifies too quickly as it rises, causing a plug to form in the vent. This creates immense pressure, and eventually, volcanic gases are released, leading to an explosive eruption. Explosive volcanic eruptions have always posed significant dangers to humans. Pyroclastic flows, a mixture of volcanic gases, ash, and rock fragments with temperatures reaching up to 700 degrees Celsius. Mud flows, lahars, volcanic bombs, particles ranging in size from a brick to a small car that are ejected explosively from stratovolcanoes, and even climate change are all phenomena associated with explosive eruptions. Mount Ararat, which is also a stratovolcano, produced such an eruption in 1840. At that time, many villages around Mount Ararat, as well as the towns of Do Bayezid, Maku, and Ordubad, were completely destroyed. Up to 10,000 people lost their lives. In the spiritual archives of the Ararat Diocese, eyewitness accounts of the earthquake and landslide from Mount Ararat in the summer of 1840 were found. Many witnesses mentioned the following. Immediately after the main shock of the earthquake, a massive cloud resembling a column of smoke rose above the canyon on the northern slope of Mount Ararat, where the village of Akori and the monastery of St. Jacob were located. The cloud was lit from within by bright red and blue lights, and a strong, pungent smell of sulfur spread around. Large stones weighing 660, 1,100 pounds were scattered over a distance of 1.9, 2.5 miles. This was accompanied by sharp sounds in the canyon, reminiscent of artillery fire. The cloud rose to the summit of Mount Ararat, and from beneath it, another cloud of red translucent dark dust rolled down at tremendous speed. In an instant, the dark, bright whirlwind of clouds descended upon the village of Akori, destroying it, killing 1,900 villagers, and burning the trees in the village gardens. After this, the landslide reached the village and the monastery. A landslide of blue liquid mud mixed with large boulders moved at great speed and had a sharp odor. Ahead of the flow's front was an air wave of enormous speed and destructive force. The landslide traveled a distance of 4.3 miles and stopped at an elevation of 2,953 feet above the Ararat Valley, forming a dam at the mouth of the Akori Canyon. Behind the dam, large masses of semi-melted ice, mud, rocks, and water accumulated. The cloud that had risen to the summit of Mount Ararat covered the sky and poured rain, even though the weather had been clear. The soil and fields in the area affected by this torrential rain were covered with a thick layer of blue, sharp-smelling mud. The rainwater in the puddles was bright blue, resembling the color of vitriol. Deep fissures formed in the Akori Canyon after the earthquake, releasing murky, vitriol, water, with a strong sulfur smell. Monks from the Ekmiadzin Monastery, 34 miles from Ararat, also noticed a strong sulfur smell. On July 6, 1840, at 7 a.m., a strong shock broke through the landslide dam at the mouth of the Akori Canyon, and streams of melted ice, mud, and rocks surged down again. Traveling at high speed for 13 miles and reaching the Aras River Valley, they spread out in a front 7.5 miles wide. The landslide destroyed the town of Aralik, several villages, military barracks, and also dammed the Sevjur River. Analysis of these reports suggests that the 1840 earthquake, with a magnitude of 7.4, was accompanied by an explosive phreatic eruption of the Bandai type. The eruption caused the ejection of volcanic bombs, an eruptive cloud that rose to the summit of Ararat, and a pyroclastic flow that descended on the village of Akori. It was also accompanied by secondary volcanic effects, acid rain and lahars, mud flows from the summit area of the volcano. According to scientists, the volume of the 1840 Ararat mud flow was 108,000 cubic meters, 
141,000 cubic yards, and its speed was about 175 meters per second, 393 miles per hour. The earthquake that triggered this eruption caused a seismogenic surface rupture 45 miles long. The youngest initial eruptions of Mount Ararat are over 10,000 years old. Additionally, Analysis of archival, chronicle, and archaeological sources has revealed evidence of historical volcanic activity around 2500 BCE in the first half of the 2nd century CE, at the end of the 3rd and beginning of the 4th century CE, and in 1450 CE. Mount Ararat, also known as Arada or Masis, consists of two main cones. Greater Ararat, reaching a height of 16,946 feet, and Lesser Ararat, with a height of 12,782 feet. The volcanoes are located on the northwestern edge of a major fault line that is 199 miles long and 50 miles wide. The fault zone is characterized by high seismic activity and earthquakes with magnitudes above 7. Scientists assess the Ararat volcanic system as a high-risk area for Armenia and neighboring countries. Mountain formation in the Armenian highland continues to this day. Evidence of this includes geothermal activity and the Nemrut and Tondrak volcanoes, as well as other active volcanoes. Active Volcanoes Nemrut is a young polygenic stratovolcano located on the Armenian highland on the western shore of Lake Van. It stands 9,629 feet tall, with a base circumference of 31 miles. The summit features a large caldera with a diameter of five miles, the largest crater in the entire Armenian highland. In the western part of the crater, there are lakes. Hot gases, water, and steam emanate from the crater and slopes. Notably, Lake Van, the largest soda lake in the world with no outlet, was formed as a result of one of the major eruptions of this volcano. The last known eruption of Nemrut occurred on April 13, 1692, indicating its activity. Tondrak. Mount Tenderek, located in the western part of the Armenian highland in modern-day Turkey, is one of the unique geological formations of the region. With a height of 11,762 feet, it rises above the Aras, Euphrates, and Arax rivers. Tenderek is notable for its summit, which features a conical and concave shape with a trap-like crater inside. The crater has a diameter of about 6,561 feet and reaches a depth of 1,050 feet. Sulfur gases and high-temperature steam erupt forcefully from it. The crater also contains hot springs. Its most recent eruption occurred in 1855. Armenia is a geologically active region. In studying geothermal activity, scientists have determined that magma sources in the volcanoes are located at an average depth of 1.5 to 1.9 miles. The significant heat in the Earth's crust, ranging from 95 to 181 degrees Fahrenheit, is a direct result of recent magmatic activity. The fact that the Earth's surface is still being actively shaped by volcanic activity today is very important. Without thorough and detailed study of this issue, timely and effective responses to volcanic activity will be impossible, which could ultimately lead to human casualties. However, volcanologists often study only a few local volcanoes and may not see the broader picture globally, which is a significant problem. At the end of 2024, our planet will enter an active phase of a 12,000-year cycle, Note that many volcanoes in the Armenian highland were very active at the beginning of the Holocene, around 12,000 years ago. Currently, there is an increase in seismic and volcanic activity worldwide. Many volcanoes that were considered dormant are beginning to awaken. According to data provided by the International Committee on Issues of Global Changes of the Geological Environment, geochange, volcanic activity has increased throughout the 20th century. It is noteworthy that from 1860 to 2000, the number of volcanic eruptions increased by 80%, and from 2000 to 2013, it rose by 60%. Currently, the so-called hot spots have become more active, which refers to already established channels. 
However, new zones are also emerging where magma is breaking through the Earth's crust. Notable examples include Mauna Loa in Hawaii, Sakurajima in Japan, the Reykjanes and Askja volcanoes in Iceland, the supervolcanoes Campi Flegre in Italy, and Taupo in New Zealand and many others. The Taupo volcano was considered dormant, having last erupted 24,000 years ago. Volcanoes in Alaska and Kamchatka are waking up as well. Now, there is a rapid rise of anomalously hot molten magma occurring in various volcanoes around the world. The chemical composition of the lava is changing significantly due to the continuous influx of new magma from below. It is being observed at multiple volcanoes. In October 2023, scientists discovered evidence of high levels of helium-3 in rock formations on Baffin Island, Canada. In 2019, a research team analyzed rocks formed from silicate melt that seeped to the Earth's surface from the depths of the mantle. The samples were collected from the Pilbara Craton in Australia, Reunion Island, and the Kerguelen Archipelago in the Indian Ocean. This time, the researchers focused on tungsten, a chemical element present in both the Earth's core and mantle. These observations indicate leaks from the Earth's core. As a result of this increased magma activity, other anomalous volcanic processes are being recorded as well. For instance, in 2019, a new underwater volcano named Mayotte appeared off the coast of Madagascar. Magma suddenly broke through a new vent, creating a new volcano. In 2023, an eruption occurred from an unknown volcano off the coast of Iwo Jima in Japan, leading to the formation of a new island. From August to November 2020, 85,000 earthquakes were recorded off the northwest coast of Antarctica in the Bransfield Strait, where a previously considered inactive volcano, Orca, was stirring. The magma was pushing to the surface, burning through two-thirds of a 10-kilometer thick section of the Earth's crust within just six months. A series of powerful tremors even shifted King George Island by 11 centimeters. In November 2023, in Iceland, Anomalously hot magma traveled 3.1 miles in just a few days, prompting the emergency evacuation of the town of Grindavik. In the Canary Islands in 2021, the eruption of the Cumbre Vieja volcano inundated over 3,000 buildings with unusually fluid lava and created a lava field covering more than 12,000 square meters. The eruption of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai volcano in 2022 was described as the most powerful observed eruption, primarily because it is an underwater volcano. Water is one of the most explosive substances on the planet. When it violently interacts with molten magma, it can cause massive explosions. The explosion at Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai was extraordinarily powerful, reaching the mesosphere. This happened because the lava that collided with the water was abnormally liquid and hot. Since 1995, the number and intensity of earthquakes worldwide have been increasing. In the last five years, there has been an anomalous pattern in volcanic eruptions. There is a rise in deep focus earthquakes occurring deeper than 43 miles, as well as earthquakes at the ocean floor along mid-ocean ridges. There is an observed increase in earthquake energy. Seismic activity at volcanoes is also rising which is a sign that magma is breaking through the Earth's crust and will soon begin to flood the surface. This occurs every 12,000 year cycle of cataclysms and every 24,000 years, volcanic eruptions are particularly strong. Armenia is a country of volcanoes. So far, most of these volcanoes are dormant. However, we see a global trend that shows that magma is beginning to accumulate in the magma chambers of many dormant volcanoes, indicating that these volcanoes are preparing for eruptions. Scientists believe that the possibility of future eruptions in Armenia cannot be ignored, particularly in the Ararat Valley, which is a densely populated area where Armenia, Turkey, Iran, and Nakhchivan meet, housing numerous cities and significant agricultural energy and industrial facilities. What can we do to mitigate the destructive consequences? 
Currently, volcanic monitoring systems are unevenly developed around the planet, making it difficult to create accurate forecasts. In many cases, scientists do not have much time to warn people. For dormant volcanoes, determining the exact time of an eruption is even more challenging, as specialists may have insufficient data about the site. Volcanologists suggest several methods to improve monitoring and prevent consequences. First of all, to identify regions with heightened threats, which will require new interdisciplinary research. It is also required to develop a public alert program and establish emergency response centers worldwide to enhance the existing global database on magmatic eruptions. The use of artificial intelligence in this area would make it possible to develop more detailed forecasts of future eruptions. Experts insist on launching a special satellite equipped with infrared cameras, although implementing this technology universally has not yet been achieved. Scientists believe it is necessary to take measures to directly influence volcanic processes. Technically, penetrating magma chambers is already possible. Studies should be conducted to assess the possibility of manipulating magma or rocks to reduce the explosive risk of eruptions. It is clear that all these activities require the consolidation of the scientific and resource potential of the global community. We, ordinary people, can form a public request to support scientists in creating a unified scientific center to address climate issues. This must be done urgently while we still have light, heating, food, internet access, and the necessary equipment. The issue of risk assessment while summing up various natural hazards requires targeted research. That's why the unification and collaboration of scientists worldwide is necessary. You know what caught my attention? Some of these volcanoes erupted 12,000 years ago. Considering that our planet is now entering a more powerful phase of the 24,000-year cycle, we have reason to be concerned. In my opinion, it's high time we sounded the alarm. Absolutely. We'll revisit the topic of the 12,000-year cycle in more detail later. Another natural phenomenon that causes significant damage annually is landslides, which cover nearly 35,000 hectares in Armenia. They drastically alter the landscape, damage structures, roads, and agricultural lands, and cause major disasters with human casualties. Another real threat to our people is landslides. The territory of Armenia is approximately 70% represented 
by mountainous and submountainous relief, which is characterized by a high potential for dangerous geological processes such as earthquakes, landslides, soil erosion, and flooding. In fact, all these processes are interconnected. The disruption of the natural vegetation and soil cover virtually eliminates evaporation from the water balance, which leads to a rise in the groundwater table and the flooding of areas, provoking the occurrence of erosion, landslides, and mud flows. Most landslide processes are associated with zones of active faults. The largest landslides are often caused by earthquakes and floods. Based on observations by experts from Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, the natural disaster map of the South Caucasus, 2009, was compiled, which is crucial for assessing hazards and risks in the South Caucasus, especially in Armenia. The map contains information about earthquakes, landslides, mud flows, floods, and droughts. The study of mud flows in Armenia began in 1972. As a result, maps of hazardous zones where mud flows are likely to occur were created. These maps were later updated and published. In 2002, the Armenian Rescue Service compiled a mud flow hazard map as part of the National Action Plan to Combat Desertification in Armenia. Pay attention to the following data. 100% of Armenia's territory is in a seismic hazard zone, with 4.5% in the very high threat zone, 89.8% .8 in the high seismic threat zone, and 5.7% in the moderate threat zone. This means a strong earthquake, followed by landslides and destruction, is possible in any of these zones. Therefore, every resident of Armenia is exposed to this risk. Climatic events around the world show that all cataclysms, including earthquakes, are gaining strength and becoming more frequent. Even if someone is lucky enough to survive an earthquake, there are no guarantees of safety as the earthquake acts as a trigger, initiating secondary effects such as landslides and mud flows. Now let's look at the flood map. The territory of our country is at high risk of flooding. Next is the landslide hazard map. From this data, we see that 79.11% of our country's territory is in a landslide hazard zone, and 57.78% of the population lives in these areas. Here is the drought hazard map. Just imagine that our territories will suffer from several natural disasters, earthquakes, landslides, mud flows, floods, and on top of that, droughts. Where are we going to grow crops then? What are we going to eat? On one hand, there are floods, and on the other, there are water shortages. There won't be resources for irrigating cultivated lands. How will we survive in these conditions? We understand that these maps reflect a real threat to the population. And as conditions worsen, these climatic disasters will inevitably manifest themselves. The trend of worsening climatic conditions has already spread worldwide. And as we can see, climatic events are only increasing in both scale and intensity. Therefore, we shouldn't think that things will soon settle on their own and the climate Cerberus won't come to your home. On the contrary, it will appear in your yard quite soon if you haven't encountered it yet. Thus, Armenia's high seismic activity, mountainous terrain, and markedly continental climate naturally mean that natural disasters such as earthquakes, landslides, collapses, and mud flows will inevitably occur in our territory. The density and depth of mountain relief junctions, the prevalence of steep and convex slopes, along with fairly intense river erosion that deepens the channels or erodes the base of slopes, bring instability to their equilibrium. Thus, all these factors create conditions for the formation of landslides in Armenia. 40.1% of the Republic's territory has a dissection depth of more than 100 meters and 25.9% more than 200 meters. This is a significant contribution to slope instability, especially where there are masses of loose rock sediment which under certain circumstances may shift down the slope. There have always been many landslides in Armenia. They are mainly prevalent in northern Armenia, in the areas of Vanadzor and Kapan. Large cities regularly suffer from mud flows. Yerevan, Vanadzor, Gyumri, Kapan, Goris, Alaverdi, and many other localities, as well as railways and highways, various utility lines, agricultural lands, and so on, the protection of which is an important governmental concern. Landslides have been studied since 1926. However, these studies were mostly descriptive. Boreholes were drilled, and large sums of money were spent on this, but none of these boreholes reach the slip plane, that is, the surface along which the mass of Earth slides. Usually it has a shale surface with a high concentration of moisture, making it as slippery as ice. Therefore, it is called the slip plane.
Yes, there are large landslides in Armenia. First and foremost is the Hagharzin landslide. The Hagharzin landslide began forming back in the 1980s. It was then reactivated during the Spitak earthquake and continued developing. Initially, three separate blocks formed, and then they combined to create a single landslide with a volume of more than two million cubic meters. It is active. It revives and usually reactivates in the spring when it rains. During this time, snow in the mountains also melts, causing the landslide to become more active. It moves, blocks the riverbed of the Agstev River and raises the water level in the village area, flooding riverside houses, schools, shops, and the water in these buildings rises up to one meter. Recently, landslides have indeed become more active. This is due to several factors. Firstly, climatic changes have played a significant role. There has been an increase in precipitation. We can clearly observe the anomalies where the amount of rainfall that usually falls over several months or more occurs in a short period. Naturally, this leads to flooding and inundations. In the area where a depression with erosion processes that destroy mountain rocks meets a mountain, the water moving along the river or another watercourse loses its energy when encountering obstacles. This released energy destroys the watercourse. In this zone, as well as in areas with steep eroded slopes and significant drops in thalwegs, extreme atmospheric precipitation leads to maximum slope erosion, contributing to the activation of mud flows. The deposits accumulated on the slopes and in the channels of mud flow prone rivers are drawn into the mud flow by rapidly flowing rainwater, gaining destructive power. The end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century have been marked by an increase in the number of natural disasters. Experts believe that anthropogenic activities also provoke these hazards. Massive deforestation, slope cutting associated with infrastructure construction, and so on. A landslide does not form due to a single cause. For example, a very strong earthquake can indeed cause a block to be dislodged. But usually, three groups of causes are identified. One group is the alteration of the slope due to natural processes or human activities. What is meant by slope alteration? Slope cutting, for example, where a slope is cut to create a platform for a road. For example, the Hagharzin landslide. The energy crisis has led to widespread deforestation, primarily near populated areas. Simultaneously, after the Spitak earthquake, there has been extensive construction development in previously landslide-prone areas in the northern regions of the country. The destruction of slopes for road construction and various utilities is common. However, no one considers that heavily loading a slope will eventually cause it to shift. Factors contributing to landslide formation include heavy irrigation of slopes in gardens and orchards, livestock grazing, plowing of mountain slopes, and unregulated irrigation practices using glacial lakes. As a result, between 1990 and 2005, Armenia lost 20% of its forested area, or about 15,600 acres of forest, leading to a significant increase in the risk of landslides and mudflows. In Armenia, where mudflow foci are mainly landslide and erosion-induced, the most significant activity is typically associated with rain floods, occurring from May to October. However, as we observe, mudflows and landslides have started occurring outside this above-mentioned period. Throughout their history, Central Asian and Caucasian countries have repeatedly suffered from devastating disasters, which have caused loss of life and significant economic damage to the population. This region faces nearly all types of natural and technological threats, including earthquakes, floods, landslides, mud flows, debris flows, avalanches, droughts, and extreme temperatures. Earthquakes are the most significant threat, leading to fatalities, in the destruction of buildings and infrastructure. However, they also cause secondary consequences such as landslides, mud flows, and avalanches. In our mountainous region, there is ample evidence of the devastating power of these secondary effects. They have been responsible for numerous fatalities during earthquakes in Armenia, 
Spitak, 1988, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Climate change is expected to greatly increase the frequency of disasters related to hydrometeorological threats, and we already observe it. The global rise in temperatures negatively impacts hydrometeorological conditions, leading to more frequent flooding. Floods are among the most destructive natural phenomena. According to statistics, from 1998 to 2005, there were over 1,200 major river floods registered across all continents. The highest number of events was observed in Asia, accounting for 40 to 50 percent of the total number each year. Overall, the peak number of floods occurred in July and August, 34 percent, while the lowest number was recorded from February to April, 20 percent. According to the Ministry of Agriculture of the Republic of Armenia, in 2001, adverse weather conditions during the spring and summer period, such as prolonged heavy rains, hail, winds, and flash floods, affected 85,543 hectares of crops, causing damage estimated at around $43 million. In 2009, 50 dangerous hydrometeorological events were recorded, including heavy rains, flooding of significant areas in the northern part of the Republic, which were accompanied by flash floods and landslides. Floods and flash floods affected the villages of Shiva, Rend, and Agavnadzor. The first floors of buildings in Aparan were flooded. The Getty River eroded 600 meters of the Dilijan Shambarak Highway, causing severe damage in Shambarak. The Tanzut River overflowed its banks in Vanadzor. The dams of Akurian, Joghaz, Aparan, Spendarian, and other reservoirs were under threat of breach. In the spring of 2014, a sharp increase in air temperature was recorded in the Aragat Sot region, with temperatures rising by 10 to 15 degrees Celsius over a few days. This was accompanied by prolonged heavy rainfall, leading to intense snowmelt on Mount Ararat and resulting in dangerous flooding and debris flows. In the village of Nigavan, a debris flow destroyed four bridges and blocked 1.5 kilometers of rural road. In the town of Aparan, 50 houses were flooded and 40 houses were submerged in the village of Kuchak. Throughout the region, telephone lines and water supplies were disrupted and more than 100 power line supports were damaged. The year 2015 was marked by extreme hydrometeorological events, with significant damage from floods and debris flows affecting the Shirak region. Farmland was swamped, streets were flooded, and basements and ground floors of buildings in Artik were inundated. Bridges in the villages of Saralunj, Anushavan, and Norkayank were damaged. In Armenia, there are more than 2,000 major landslides. Many of these are found around Dilijan, Ajavan, Kapan, Vanadzor, and other cities, as well as in numerous villages. According to large-scale satellite imagery, the specified zones have been identified and mapped for areas of maximum landslide development. These are localized regions where large landslide bodies accumulate and active slope movement is observed. The highlighted local areas on the map represent the absolute indicators of landslide hazard for each site. The Ugedzor landslide, previously known as the Kochbek landslide, is highly active. It is located near the pass on the road that connects Yerevan with Siunik. It is the only road of strategic importance that is constantly being damaged. The landslide is moving toward the riverbed, where there is a fault. This landslide has developed precisely along this fault. On the opposite side of the road, from the adjacent ridge, large landslides have also formed. There's no alternative route for relocating the road. Both the left and right banks are completely covered by landslides. The most common type of landslide is a slip of partly loosened landslide mass on the surface of lower-lying rocks, which is often referred to as landslips. This occurs in towns like Dilijan, Ayavan, Artavan, and Shiva. Additionally, there are numerous displacements of landslide blocks, where large blocks of underlying rock detach from the main mass but still preserve their monolithicity. There are also landfalls, which are characterized by a unique type of land movement involving viscous and plastic flow, with maximum displacement amplitudes of the landslide masses, Martiros, Arevis, Auk, etc. 
All of these types of landslide displacements on Armenian territory frequently transform according to the following sequence during movement, fall, slip slide, for example, the Jermuk landslide group. Most landslide processes are directly associated with zones of active faults, through which slow creep and seismic or impulsive dislocations occur. The most dangerous landslides in the Republic are found in Ararat Province, Urtsadzor, Kotek Province, Gegadir, Yerevan, Nubarashan, Tavish Province, Akajur, Gegarkunik Province, Diprabak, Lori Province, Yeghegis. Vokjabered is a village with no future. Its area is frequently affected by landslides and rockfalls from the surrounding mountains. Because of this, sooner or later, all the houses will be destroyed. It's just a matter of time. The village is home to over 1,000 people. It is one of 230 villages in Armenia located in high-risk landslide areas. Vokchabered is just 20 kilometers from the capital, Yerevan. Ike Bagdasarian, PhD in Geological Sciences at the Institute of Geological Sciences of Armenia, who participated in a major study in 2005 and 2006, said that the village of Vokchabered is situated in the largest landslide-prone area. Its total area covers 500 hectares of clay land, which is constantly shifting. Landslide phenomena are particularly prominent in the Middle Mountain Zone. Landslides are observed in the Akurian Valley, northwest of Gyumri, and in the basins of Debed, Agstev, Vedi, Gaitik, and Voratan rivers. For example, the village of Marmashin on the left bank of the Akurian was raised to the ground and relocated to the Tuff Highlands. Considering the impact of surface and groundwater flows on landslide activity, it's clear that building water mains, and especially open water channels, is inadvisable in landslide-prone areas. However, these mistakes were made in the water supply system of Erevan City, as well as in irrigation and drainage systems of neighboring villages. Over 932 miles of transportation routes are affected by landslide risks. The presence of many fresh cracks indicates that the landslide process is developing. One of the active factors in disturbing slope stability is the presence of groundwater and surface water runoff into the landslide body. The presence of many open crevices and depressions contribute to the active infiltration of these waters. In the total surface water runoff, which infiltrates into the landslide body, a significant part belongs to spring waters. We could not find up-to-date statistical information for the last nine years on landslides, mud flows, and floods. Unfortunately, there is no publicly available information on the number of disasters that have occurred in Armenia. Why is this happening? It has to do with the consumer format we are in, where new research, which would help people realize the full scale and horror of impending climate catastrophes and take appropriate action to prevent them, is simply not needed. The lack of funding in this area leads to the fact that scientists are not engaged in this area as they work in those areas that enable them to earn a living for themselves and their families. However, with the worsening climate situation, we are in dire need of this research. Or maybe some studies are being conducted, but they are just not made public. We people have the right to know the truth because our lives depend on it. I recently approached one of our country's organizations with a proposal to conduct a study and create a predictive map showing where natural hazards might intensify due to human activity or climate change. I suggested developing a map of the current distribution of hazardous geological exogenous processes throughout Armenia and also to project potential changes in the coming years as a result of climate change and human activities. In other words, I proposed creating a predictive map of hazardous natural processes. I was told, we don't need this. Is there ongoing monitoring? No, there isn't any permanent monitoring. There's only scientific monitoring for mountain landslides. The Japanese have set up sensors to watch how the landslide movements change, and maybe there are sensors on two or three other landslides, but it's only for scientific purposes. As for the practical ones, to cover all the dangerous areas we have in our country, and it is between 130 and 180 hazardous areas, that urgently need landslide prevention measures. No, we don't have that.
What measures should be taken to avoid dangerous consequences? First, it is necessary to organize monitoring of landslides to see if the signs of a landslide are increasing. When the landslide occurred near the Aram station, five people died and 35 cars were destroyed. After all, there were signs of a landslide and the tragic consequences could have been prevented. Well, first of all, all these landslides need to be monitored and assessed to see which ones might become active. It's important to take preventive measures, like ensuring water doesn't seep into them. For example, you can set up drainage systems so the water drains away. They install wells and horizontal drains to channel the water that seeps into the landslide. I've seen similar drainage methods in China. There they had a major landslide on the slope of a coal quarry. They continuously drained water from the landslide body. They used a sloped horizontal trough to direct the water away from the landslide. This approach effectively dries the landslide. Drainage work is expensive, so it's not always done. Back in Soviet times, there were drainage systems in place for the landslides around Delegion, but they're not functioning anymore. It's possible to implement such measures here too. In Georgia, Signagi City built on a major landslide. They managed to drain it, and they keep draining the water from the landslide body. Everything is working fine. No buildings are collapsing, and everything is stable. Forty years ago, there used to be landslide stations that monitored the condition of dangerous areas and gave timely warnings about the danger. Establishing such a service would be cheaper than eliminating the consequences of landslides especially since human lives are at stake. Once again, I realize how crucial it is to put science at the service of society and prioritize the value of every human life. It's much better to prevent than to respond to consequences. We have another pressing issue to discuss, which is fundamental to all life on Earth. Let's examine the current state of water resources in our country. As of today, nearly every resident of Armenia feels the impact of water shortages. In most villages, surface or groundwater is still used for water supply, often of very poor quality. The issues of water supply and irrigation are among the most pressing. Armenia has found itself among the European countries at risk of water scarcity. This is highlighted by research conducted by the European Drought Observatory, EDO. Their studies indicate that the water situation in Armenia has worsened by 84.3%. This is one of the worst rates among European countries. The report, Towards Integrated Water Resources Management in Armenia, also states that Armenia is highly vulnerable to climate change compared to other countries. The issue of water scarcity was also raised at the scientific conference, Prospects for Sustainable Water Resources Management in the Ararat Valley, held on May 14, 2021 in Yerevan. The most sensitive sector to water scarcity is agriculture. According to forecasts, a 25% reduction in river flow will lead to a 15-34% reduction in the productivity of irrigated cropland, 24% on average. Well, actually, the biggest problem with water is the lack of water for irrigation. Around 70%, 70, is used for growing crops, is used for, for food production, right? And that is a massive impact. 
If you can't uh, provide water for those industries, forget about being able to take a shower. You won't be able to eat. You won't be able to generate enough food for your industries. And I think that's going to have a very severe impact in the lives of a lot of people in developed countries. The energy sector will also suffer as Armenia relies on its rivers for hydroelectric power generation and cooling water for nuclear and thermal power plants. It is time to acknowledge the need to change our attitude towards water. The water crisis in Armenia is deepening and has a global dimension. But in our case, it is exacerbated by the lack of or worn-out infrastructure and our attitude towards water. If we map out and tour the regions, we would be astonished by the magnitude of the water problem, says Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. Former Minister of Nature Protection and advisor to the Director of the Institute of Geology at the Armenian Academy of Sciences, Sarkis Shahazizian, adds that the irrigation and drinking water systems are in deplorable condition, resulting in 70-80% of the water being lost. Sure, 10% losses can be natural, things happen, but for such a volume to be lost, and these are just the official figures, we don't even know the actual amount, says the expert. The demand for groundwater in Armenia's cities, industry and agriculture is continuously increasing. In 2000, water consumption in the Republic was 1,275 million cubic meters per year. But by 2012, this figure had risen to 1,520 million cubic meters per year. What is causing the increase in water consumption? After all, Armenia's population has remained relatively stable. One reason is the rapid development of pond farms, starting in 2006. These farms specialize in breeding fish species that require the purest flowing water in industrial quantities. This has led to a sharp increase in drilling wells. Water reserves have been decreasing, and this has become noticeable to the naked eye. The well yield is the volume of output extracted from a well per unit of time. Second, day, hour, etc. As recently as 2009, wells in the village of Apaga in the Armavir region were gushing and providing central drinking water supply and ample irrigation for cultivated agricultural lands by gravity flow. The water level in the wells was visibly dropping by 20 centimeter per year. From 1983 to 2013, Piezometric levels drop by an average of 6-9 meters, and in some places, by as much as 15 meters. The area of positive pressure decreased from 32,760 hectares in 1983 to 10,706 hectares in 2013, representing a reduction of approximately 67%. As a result, the number of communities using artesian wells for irrigation and domestic water supply decreased from 44 in 1983 to 13 in 2013. Many regions of the Republic, such as Tallinn, Ujjan, Bagramyan, Shagap, Savabird, Fontan, and others, are experiencing an acute water shortage. Currently, residents are forced to use pumps to extract drinking water from depths of 15-20 meters. Now imagine, when there is a power outage, the population is left without drinking water. Another source of water for irrigation and hydroelectric power in Armenia is Lake Sivan. Since 1947-1948, the water level in the lake has been dropping sharply. Blue line on the graph. This has led to serious ecological and economic problems, including the deterioration of water quality, destruction of natural habitats, and loss of biodiversity. Scientists attributed this to excessive water use. Therefore, starting in the 1980s, stabilization programs were implemented. These included the construction of the Arpa Sivan and Voratan Arpa tunnels which transfer up to 250 and 165 million cubic meters of water respectively, 
and setting outflow limits, yellow-green line, to 170 million cubic meters per year. As a result, the water level of Lake Sivan has been gradually rising since 2001. In 2011, the level stabilized at 1,900 meters and has since fluctuated between 1,900 and 1,800 meters and 1,963 meters. Against the backdrop of the global climate situation, it is concerning that in 2024, the level of Lake Sivan has started to decline compared to 2023. What measures are currently being taken to address the issue? On August 29, 2019, a decision was made to organize water supply for fish farming operations in the Ararat Valley using a closed-loop water system. This will create a unified fish production system, including the establishment of water usage limits for 120 existing farms. Implement the project, 460 million drams, approximately 1,186,000 U.S. dollars, were allocated from the budget. In 2019, the Armenian government decided to shut down 97 water extraction wells in the Ararat Valley, allocating 37.9 million drams, around 98,000 U.S. dollars, from the reserve fund. This measure is expected to conserve approximately 30 million cubic meters of water. The idea of a complete ban on the use of artesian wells during non-irrigation periods was also discussed. Unfortunately, this will not resolve the issue, as it needs to be addressed on a global level. As part of the government program to address the issue, there are plans to build 15 new water reservoirs by 2026. Nine of these projects have encountered delays due to the need for more thorough investigations. Now, let's take a broader view of the issue. The problem of water scarcity and the looming water crisis also exists in European countries. Europe has been suffering from a serious drought for several years. The situation reached a critical point in the summer of 2022, when the most powerful drought in the last 500 years hit Europe. The abnormal heat in European Union countries was compared to the onset of an apocalypse. France was fighting extensive forest fires while in Switzerland, a pass that had been covered in ice for 2,000 years melted. According to calculations, the total damage to EU countries from extreme weather amounted to $20 billion. By 2023, the situation had gotten even worse. Almost every river in the European Union had dried up to some extent. In the Spanish region of Catalonia, a state of emergency was declared as the area faced the most severe drought in its history. Residents were banned from washing cars and filling up swimming pools. The abnormal heat led to crop failure, resulting in rising prices for all products, including meat. The drought exacerbated the energy crisis in Europe. Due to low water levels, most hydroelectric power plants in France and Italy significantly reduced their electricity generation. In France, the water became so warm that it was unsuitable for cooling nuclear power plants. Europe was like bacon in a frying pan. Scientists are sounding the alarm as water levels in bodies of water are sharply declining worldwide. Researchers have found that more than half of the world's largest lakes and reservoirs now contain less water than they did three decades ago. Less water in lakes and rivers means less water for human consumption, as well as for irrigation and industrial use. Low water levels complicate electricity generation. Floods that follow prolonged droughts do not alleviate the situation. Water cannot be absorbed into dry soil. It flows as if sliding on the ice, sweeping away everything in its path, causing floods, mudslides, and landslides. By the most conservative estimates, over 40% of the world's population will be living in regions facing water scarcity by 2030. In major cities, water will be rationed and its quality will steadily deteriorate. Epidemics will resurge, bringing back medieval diseases. The water crisis will lead to food shortages, triggering large-scale population migrations. Governments will collapse like houses of cards. Regions with water resources will close off within borders unrelated to national boundaries. Some countries are drowning, while others are drying up. 
and some experience droughts first, followed by flooding. The water situation is indeed critical, and as you can understand, it will become increasingly severe each year. This is due to the sharp deterioration in climate conditions and environmental pollution. The issue of water scarcity and poor quality is being addressed at the international level. Ensuring access to clean water for the global population is one of the United Nations' sustainable development goals. According to a new report, UN Water, today 2.2 billion people still live without access to safely managed drinking water. Thus, the UN goal of ensuring this access for all by 2030 is therefore far from being attained. Between 2002 and 2021, droughts affected more than 1.4 billion people. As of 2022, roughly half of the world's population experienced severe water scarcity for at least part of the year, while one quarter faced extremely high levels of water stress, using over 80% of their annual renewable freshwater supply. Climate change is projected to increase the frequency and severity of these phenomena, with acute risk for social stability. But what is the primary cause of the shrinking rivers and lakes and the decrease in groundwater and artesian water levels? According to satellite observations, climatic and hydrological models, water volumes in all major natural lakes and reservoirs have decreased by more than 50% over the past three decades. This is happening globally due to the deformation of the Earth's crust caused by increased seismic activity and changes in the planet's equatorial and polar diameters. As a result, water is being lost through fissures and faults. As we have mentioned, despite Armenia being a small country, it has a large number of tectonic faults. These are the primary reason for the reduction in water reserves in the Republic. But what solutions are being proposed to people? The only solution currently being proposed is strict monitoring and limiting water consumption. However, this is not a real solution. Water is the foundation of life and every person needs access to sufficient amounts for drinking, as well as for all domestic, technical, agricultural, and industrial uses. Simply restricting and conserving water will not solve the problem. Instead of imposing limitations and prohibitions on water use, we need to advance to a new level and find solutions for new sources of water. Today we have technology that can provide every person, anywhere on the planet, with the necessary amount of water. The issue of water scarcity on an industrial scale can be addressed through the widespread use of atmospheric water generators. We will discuss this in the second section of our Kaleidoscope of Facts. The climate situation in Armenia is not just a problem of one country. Climate disasters are increasing globally, as evidenced by daily reports from around the world. We'll explore their causes next. You already understand that something is wrong with our planet. And you are probably already thinking about the cause of this global catastrophe and how to protect yourself and your loved ones in this situation? The rapid and sudden increase in climate, atmospheric, and geodynamic catastrophes around the world indicates that, combined with human factors, there is a massive amount of additional energy building up inside our Earth. Beneath the Earth's crust lies a complex thermodynamic system that has been functioning for billions of years. Thanks to its stability, life on Earth is possible. 
However, any changes in one of the underground layers affect the entire system, including the surface layer where we live. The information we are about to present comes from the report on the progression of climatic disasters on Earth and their catastrophic consequences, which is based on research and work by an interdisciplinary group of scientists studying climate change and searching for effective solutions for over 30 years. Let's take a look at the changes that have occurred on our planet over the past 30 years. In 1995, scientific laboratories around the world independently discovered alarming planetary anomalies. Since then, changes have occurred in the geophysical and geodynamic parameters of Earth. Specifically, the North Magnetic Pole, which had previously been moving at a constant speed of 10 tonners kilometers year, suddenly increased its speed to 55 kilometers year and changed its trajectory towards Siberia, the Timur Peninsula. Currently, the North Magnetic Pole has moved more than a thousand kilometers towards Siberia. Such a rapid movement of the magnetic pole has not been recorded in the past 10,000 years. In the same year, 1995, a disruption in Earth's rotation was recorded. The direction of the planet's rotational axis changed, and its speed increased 17-fold. While scientists had previously noted a deceleration in Earth's rotation up until 1995, sharp increases in the acceleration of the planet's rotational speed were observed in 1995 and 2016 events that have no historical precedent in observational records. According to the Earth Orientation Center at the Paris Observatory, in 1995 and 2016, the length of the day began to decrease by a few milliseconds, indicating that Earth started rotating faster than usual. Now you can see that in 1995 there was a sudden and simultaneous change in three geophysical parameters of Earth. Acceleration of the drift of the North Magnetic Pole, change in direction, and acceleration of the drift of the rotational axis. Acceleration of the planet's rotation. It is important to understand that each of these parameters is interrelated with the state of the Earth's core. In other words, the magnetic field generates the geodynamo within Earth's core, while the planet's rotation speed and axis are influenced by the Earth's center of mass, i.e., the inner core. This suggests that in 1995, significant and anomalous changes began occurring in Earth's core, requiring enormous amounts of energy. In 1997, 1998, another significant event occurred, the consequences of which we are now experiencing, a displacement of the Earth's inner core. This unprecedented phenomenon was detected by scientists using satellite data from the Earth's Center of Mass Research. As a result of this displacement, the planet's core moved northward along a line from western Antarctica to western Siberia, towards the Timur Peninsula, Russian Federation. This phenomenon was simultaneously recorded by four different scientific teams, each independently observing anomalous changes in various geophysical parameters of Earth that indicate this event. Using satellite data, a team of researchers from Moscow State University and the Institute of Physics of the Earth, Russian Academy of Sciences, detected the displacement of the Earth's center of mass in 1998. At the same time, scientists at the Medicina Station in Italy recorded a jump in gravitational force. Simultaneously, a sharp change in Earth's shape was observed, measured using the U.S. satellite laser ranging system. The planet began to expand abnormally along the equatorial region, 
whereas the previous trend had been in the opposite direction. According to scientists, the displacement of the core has caused changes in all of Earth's layers. Dr. Y.V. Barkin, Doctor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences and Professor, Dr. G.Y. Smolkov, Doctor of Technical Sciences, and Professor, Dr. M.L. Arushinov, Doctor of Geographical Sciences, and Professor, V.E. Kane, corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, honored professor at Lomonosov Moscow State University, and doctor of geological and mineralogical sciences, along with many other scientists, believe that the core displacement is the cause of changes in all of Earth's layers. Just think about it. Earth's core is comparable in size to the moon. The question arises, what forces are acting on it to cause such a significant displacement and similar changes in the planet's internal structure? In addition, the current increase in earthquakes is not just due to stress in the Earth's crust, but also due to a rise in global magmatic activity deep within our planet. Today, there is an exponential increase in deep-focus earthquakes. A significant spike is observed in 1995, along with many other geodynamic anomalies. Deep-focus earthquakes are seismic events that occur at depths greater than 300 kilometers and can reach up to 750 kilometers below the Earth's surface in conditions of high pressure and temperature. In these areas, it is expected that mantle material would deform plastically rather than brittly, and therefore should not generate earthquakes. Nevertheless, such events are regularly recorded and appear as real explosions within the mantle. What causes these explosions in the mantle? As the internal core heats up, it further heats and melts the outer liquid core, which consists of molten iron. This molten iron flows continuously around the inner core. Oscillations in the inner core within the liquid environment cause the molten outer core to seep into the mantle. Essentially, the outer core is leaking into the mantle like an egg breaking out of its shell, and this is happening with increased intensity. In areas where this leaking liquid core meets hotter, more liquid magma, hotter and more fluid magma streams are formed. When such superheated magma interacts with cooler, not yet heated magma in the mantle, it creates vortices and counterflows, leading to cavitation explosions. These events resemble very powerful nuclear explosions and release energy equivalent to hundreds of thousands of nuclear bombs. Since the environment is a liquid, plastic medium, the force of the explosion is partially absorbed in this medium. However, the explosive wave is reflected. The residual force does not spread in one direction, but disperses tangentially, impacting one or another lithospheric plate and causing its oscillations. One cavitation explosion triggers a whole cascade of explosions within the planet. We do not directly observe the cavitation explosions themselves, but rather their ricochet from specific zones inside the planet. It is this ricochet from cavitation explosions that we detect as deep-focus earthquakes recorded by seismologists on the surface. All significant deep-focus earthquakes affect Earth's lithosphere and supervolcanoes. Volcanoes are interconnected by liquid magma. Cavitation explosions are dangerous because their waves propagate through the liquid magma, potentially creating stress at the boundaries of lithospheric plates and along faults. This stress manifests as a series of earthquakes. It was because of the increase in deep-focus earthquakes that the catastrophe in Turkey and Syria occurred on February 6, 2023. Two powerful quakes with magnitudes of 7.8 and 7.5 on the Anatolian Fault. 
A year prior to this event, in 2021, most of the deep focus earthquakes occurred beneath the Middle East, including the territories of Turkey and Syria. Over the course of that year, 190 earthquakes at depths of 700 Teorikioners or more were recorded in that region, compared to only 70 worldwide. The alarming reality is that the number and magnitude of deep focus earthquakes are rising. Over the past 28 years, the number of deep focus earthquakes has increased fivefold. This surge indicates that Earth's core is rapidly destabilizing and heating up. All of this points to the approach of monstrous catastrophes, including earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The heating of Earth's interior is leading to the melting of glaciers. Over the past 29 years, ice loss from major ice sheets has accelerated, with current ice loss rates in Greenland being 400% higher and in Antarctica 25% higher compared to the early 1990s. Let's look at Antarctica as an example. Research shows that since 1992, Antarctica has lost nearly 3 trillion tons of ice, equivalent to 1.2 billion Olympic-sized swimming pools. The Pine Island Glacier, considered the most vulnerable point in Antarctica, loses about 45 billion tons of ice annually. Another well-known Antarctic glacier is the massive Thwaites Ice Shelf. A staggering 86% of all ice loss in Antarctica occurs in West Antarctica, where rapid retreat and thinning of the Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers are happening. Remarkably, glaciers are melting predominantly in the western part of the continent. It is interesting to note that West Antarctica is one of the largest volcanic regions on Earth, with over 140 volcanoes found beneath the ice. Based on aeromagnetic observations, scientists from Germany and the British Antarctic Survey created a map of geothermal heat flow in West Antarctica and discovered a significant influx of geothermal heat from Earth's interior beneath the Thwaites Glacier. The geothermal flow in West Antarctica correlates with areas of increased glacier melting. A team of scientists from the University of Rhode Island and the University of East Anglia has discovered a new factor contributing to the rapid melting of the Pine Island Glacier in Antarctica, a previously unknown active volcano buried deep beneath the ice. The researchers found volcanic activity under the ice sheet that is emitting 25 times more thermal energy than that of a dormant volcano. NASA scientists have also recorded a massive magma plume under West Antarctica, known as the Marie Bird Plume, covering an area of nearly one million square kilometers. Marie Bird Land is a region in West Antarctica with high volcanic activity. The volcanism in Marie Bird Land is caused by a hotspot, which is an area where a mantle plume, flow of molten rock rising from deep within the mantle, reaches the Earth's crust and induces volcanic activity. According to scientists' calculations, the heat from the mantle plume warms the rocks and ice layers above it almost as intensely as the Yellowstone supervolcano at 150 milliwatts per square meter and 180 milliwatts per square meter in the fault zones. This is approximately three times more heat than that of the surrounding rock layers. Researchers from Bremen University, the German Institute for Polar and Marine Research, and the British Antarctic Survey, have demonstrated that the melting of major glaciers occurs in areas of increased geothermal heat flow from the Earth's interior. The illustrations show that significant changes have occurred from the 2019 study, Left Map, to the 2021 study, Right Map, with an increase in geothermal heat flow. This indicates a rise in heat coming from Earth's interior due to magma plumes. A new international study has revealed that certain areas in West Antarctica are rising at one of the fastest rates ever recorded. The uplift rate of the bedrock in the Amundsen Sea region near the Pine Island Glacier 
is 41 millimeters per year, which is three times faster than in other regions. Even in places like Iceland and Alaska, where rapid uplift is observed, the rate typically ranges from 20 to 30 millimeters per year. Scientists have concluded that the mantle beneath West Antarctica is hotter and more fluid than previously expected. Therefore, the intense melting of Antarctic ice sheets is driven by both anthropogenic factors heating the water and geothermal heat from volcanic and magmatic activity, which has significantly increased since 1995 and continues to intensify. Anomalous warming of deep waters in the Weddell Sea is occurring right off the coast of West Antarctica. While the upper 700 meters of water remain relatively stable in temperature, deeper regions are experiencing a steady increase in temperature. The Weddell Sea is bordered by the West Antarctic Rift on one side and the submarine volcanic ridge with the South Sandwich Islands on the other. It is worth noting that the South Sandwich Islands region is one of the most seismically active areas on Earth. With a rapid increase in earthquake activity that may indicate rising magma. Let's examine the melting of Greenland's ice. Currently, the ice in Greenland is melting faster than at any time in the past 12,000 years. The graph on the screen shows the exponential increase in Greenland's ice loss from 1992 to 2018. Since the 1990s, Greenland has been losing ice, with the period from 2006 to 2012 accounting for nearly half of the total losses. Despite colder atmospheric conditions around Greenland, the rate of ice loss remained high after this period. In July 2019 alone, the Greenland ice sheet lost 197 billion tons of ice, equivalent to approximately 80 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. On the surface of the Greenland ice sheet, rivers and lakes flow, but intriguingly, rivers and lakes are also found beneath the ice, which is about 1.5 kilometers thick. To date, 60 subglacial lakes have been identified. The well-known reasons for the formation of these lakes are geothermal heat and meltwater flowing through cracks. Lakes appear because glaciers are melting from both the top and the bottom. A team of American scientists led by Professor Ralph von Fries from Ohio State University used gravitational studies to assess the thickness of Greenland's crust and found that the greatest glacier melting occurs in the northern part of the island, where the crust is thinnest. This region experiences increased geothermal heat flow due to a rising mantle plume. The same conclusion was reached by an interdisciplinary team, led by researchers from the O. Schmidt Institute of Physics of the Earth, including Irina Rogozina and Alexei Petrunin. Using seismic tomography, researchers discovered a mantle plume beneath Greenland. This magma flow rises from the boundary between the core and mantle, with its edge approaching the Earth's surface directly beneath the central part of the island, potentially serving as an additional factor melting the ice. This area also contains the highest number of subglacial lakes. Scientists calculated the theoretical heat flow corresponding to this magma plume and found that the heat is sufficient to warm the base of the glacier to the melting point. Research by scientists from Tohoku University in Japan 
further detailed the structure of the magma plume beneath Greenland. According to research by Japanese, Russian and German scientists, a magma plume located in the central part of Greenland, similar to the situation in Antarctica, is a potential cause of the accelerated melting of Greenland's glaciers in recent decades. It is likely that the two largest glaciated regions in the world, Antarctica and Greenland, are melting not only due to anthropogenic factors, but also due to increased geothermal heat from the Earth's interior. The rising heat is evident from the exponential trends in glacier melting. This suggests that magma plumes beneath West Antarctica and Central Greenland have become more active since 1995. The accumulated energy within the planet has been so significant that it has intensified magma plumes, which have begun to melt glaciers at an exponential rate. This process is accelerating, indicating a rise in planetary magmatic activity that could pose an additional serious threat to human life. Currently, there is also an abnormal increase in seismic activity near volcanoes, indicating the activation of magmatic processes, the filling of volcanic magma chambers, and their preparation for potential eruptions. Given the current atypical magmatic activity within our planet, an eruption of a supervolcano could trigger a chain reaction of volcanic explosions, leading to a global catastrophe. Volcanologists are observing another anomaly. The lava ejected by volcanoes has an unusual composition, characteristic of magma, from deep mantle layers. Over the past decade, there has been an acceleration in the rise of magma from the depths of the Earth's crust in many volcanic regions, such as Iceland, Italy, the island of Mayotte, in the Indian Ocean, and La Palma, Canary Islands, among others. This indicates an increase in volcanic activity on a global scale. Volcanologists are concerned about the rapid increase in the rate of magma ascent from the Earth's depths. The process of magma ascent, which once took hundreds or thousands of years, is now occurring in some regions in just six months. This was the case in the Bransfield Strait in 2021, where magma rose from a depth of 10 kilometers, accompanied by 85,000 earthquakes. The crust thickness in this area is 15 kilometers, and the localization of the earthquakes indicated that 10 kilometers of the crust had already been penetrated by active magma, with only 5 kilometers remaining before before it reached the surface. The rapid ascent of magma from significant depths suggests the emergence of dangerous and previously unobserved processes within the Earth. The activation of volcanoes indicates that a vast amount of energy is accumulating in the planet's interior, seeking to break through to the surface. Why are we seeing such frequent increases in the frequency and scale of extreme hydrometeorological events, such as record floods, typhoons, and unusual precipitation? The reason is the abnormal warming of the ocean. As of 2020, Ocean warming has increased by 450% over the past 30 years. Research shows that while the oceans were steadily warming from 1955 to 1986, the rate of warming has dramatically accelerated in recent decades. Scientists estimate that the energy required for the ocean to warm at its current rate is equivalent to detonating seven atomic bombs per second every second of the year, with the same power as those dropped on Hiroshima. 
this raises the question, what is the source of such a significant amount of energy? The graph displays the increase in ocean evaporation and the synchronous rise in ocean surface temperatures since 1995. You have already heard this date multiple times today. It is precisely the year when significant changes began occurring within the Earth, such as the abrupt shift of the northern magnetic pole, the sudden movement of the planet's rotational axis, the increase in underwater earthquakes, and the rise in deep focus earthquakes. Human impact, which plays a key role in the severe deterioration of conditions on our planet, is exemplified by the pollution of the Earth's primary cooling mechanism, contamination of the world's oceans with microplastics. The ocean is crucial for the planet's thermoregulation. It covers about 70% of the Earth's surface and is deeply immersed in the Earth's crust. Historically, the ocean served as a mechanism to transfer excess heat from the Earth's interior to the atmosphere and eventually into outer space. However, due to human activities, the thermal conductivity of the ocean has been significantly disrupted. This is because we started doing something that was unprecedented before, producing plastic. As a result, microplastic pollution has spread across the entire planet. Today, up to 25 million tons of micro and nanoplastics are transported thousands of kilometers by oceanic air, snow, sea spray, and fog, crossing countries, continents, and oceans. Microplastics in the environment are increasing, but no actions have been taken to remove them. Microplastics have already been found in the human body, in the blood, heart, lungs, brain, placenta, and even in breast milk. Scientists have detected microplastics in clouds, groundwater, the glaciers of Greenland and Antarctica, on the summit of Everest, and in the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. The entire thickness of the ocean is literally permeated with microplastics. It has been found in every ocean water sample. As a result of this pollution, the ocean has become less effective at dissipating heat from the lithospheric plates. And now, the plates are intensely heating up due to the rise of magma. Increased humidity from ocean evaporation leads to more intense hydrometeorological events, such as tropical hurricanes, storms, and tornadoes, as well as abnormal temperatures, precipitation, and flooding. Due to the heightened heating of the Earth's interior, and the loss of the planet's cooling capacity caused by anthropogenic factors, there is a risk that Earth may not cope with this cycle of catastrophic events. This could lead it to a fate similar to that of Mars. The unprecedented warming of the world's oceans has led to an unparalleled increase in the lower layers of the atmosphere. On the screen, you can see a graph demonstrating the unprecedented rise in global average temperatures from 1850 to 2023. In 2023, temperature values broke historical records. According to Samantha Burgess, the Deputy Director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service, CCCS, 2023 became the hottest year in at least the past 100,000 years. And in 2024, each new month is bringing with it a new record of heat. It's important to note that changes are occurring not only in the lower layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere, but also in the middle and upper layers. 
On the screen, you can see a general diagram of the atmospheric structure. The thermosphere, one of the uppermost layers of the atmosphere, has experienced record-breaking decreases in density. Since 2007, the density of the thermosphere at an altitude of 400 kilometers has inexplicably dropped by between 1.7% and 7.4% over a period of 10 years. This is confirmed by data from over 10,000 satellite orbits in the thermosphere. If the decrease in thermosphere density continues, the risk of collisions, or falls of satellites, could become very high. Moreover, the thermosphere's density fluctuates significantly during geomagnetic storms caused by solar flares. If the ongoing thinning of the thermosphere persists at the current rate, combined with a severe solar flare, it could lead to a complete failure of all navigation and satellite networks, including the global Internet. Changes have also occurred in the mesosphere, at altitudes from 50 to 90 km and the stratosphere, at altitudes from 18 to 50 km, which have significantly cooled over the past 30 years. The decrease in temperature in the middle atmosphere has been reliably established through various observational methods. Data from 1980 to 2018 show that the thickness of the stratosphere has decreased by an average of 400 meters. Simultaneously, with the reduction in density and temperature, changes in the chemical composition of the atmosphere have been recorded. Notably, a 60% decrease in oxygen concentration in the upper layers of the atmosphere, thermosphere, at an altitude of 130 km in mid-latitudes, the concentration of O2, molecular oxygen, has decreased by two to four times. Additionally, there is a decrease in the amount of atomic oxygen in the upper atmosphere. All these changes in the middle and upper atmosphere indicate global processes affecting the Earth's system. Summarizing the above facts, it can be stated that in the last few decades, the following anomalous changes have started occurring in various shells of the Earth. First, change in the planet's geophysical parameters. Abnormal acceleration of the Earth's rotation since 1995. Sharp displacement and acceleration of the drift of the planet's rotation axis in 1995. Second, change in geomagnetic parameters of the Earth's core. Sudden acceleration of the North Magnetic Pole, drift in 1995. Decrease in magnetic field intensity. Increase in the area of magnetic anomalies. Third, core. Acceleration of the liquid iron flow in the outer core since 1995. In 1997, 1998, a sharp shift of the inner core along the line from West Antarctica to Western Siberia towards the Tymir Peninsula. Fourth, mantle. Drastic increase in deep focus earthquakes at depths between 300 and 750 kilometers since 1995. Fifth, lithosphere. Increase in seismic activity since 1995. Emergence of earthquakes in regions where they have never been recorded before. Abnormal volcanic and magmatic activity. Changes in the composition of erupting lavas. Accelerated melting of glaciers from the bottom up due to increased heat coming from the interior, above magma plumes since 1995. Sixth. Ocean. Unprecedented increase in ocean surface temperatures and ocean water evaporation. Seventh. Atmosphere. Cooling of the stratosphere and mesosphere. Thinning of the thermosphere. Decrease in concentrations of atomic and molecular oxygen in different layers of the atmosphere. Increase in global air temperatures in the troposphere. Extreme increase in the power and number of hurricanes, floods, wildfires, droughts, and tornadoes. Are such changes happening only on our planet Earth? After all, our planet is part of the solar system. In fact, similar processes have begun occurring simultaneously in the interiors of other planets in the solar system, even those considered dead. These processes include volcanic activity, 
seismic activity, and magnetic anomalies. According to the hypothesis described in the report on the progression of climatic disasters on Earth and their catastrophic consequences, such phenomena can only occur if the same changes are happening in the cores of the planets in the solar system, just as they are happening on Earth. Assumptions that these phenomena in our solar system are caused by solar activity are not supported by the facts. Anomalous changes on the planets and their moons began during the solar minimum in 1995, a period of low solar activity. The graph of solar activity cycles shows that in 1995, the sun was at the minimum of its activity and thus could not have caused these changes. Therefore, the sun could not have influenced the other planets in this way. Furthermore, across the solar system, the Sun responded to cosmic influences last, likely due to its enormous mass. Since changes are occurring synchronously on all planets in the solar system, as well as on the Sun, it is logical to suggest that there is a factor from either near or distant space that is causing the appearance of vast amounts of energy within the planets. This energy accumulates within the planetary system, focusing around the cores and bypassing other layers of the planets. According to the hypothesis, this causes the cores of the planets to heat up and shift. None of the known influences, gravitational, electromagnetic, acoustic, or cosmic radiation escape detection by measuring instruments while directly impacting the core. Accordingly, the theory posits that none of the aforementioned influences could cause the changes currently observed across all planets in the solar system. Considering the facts presented, researchers from an interdisciplinary group studying climate change have developed a hypothesis suggesting that this influence operates based on unexplored physical principles. This is a phenomenon that contemporary science has not encountered before. It is an effect that is not officially recorded yet its manifestations can be observed. According to the hypothesis, this influence, consisting of a certain type of energy, interacts directly and exclusively with the Earth's inner core, without engaging with the other layers of the planet. This type of interaction may be explained by the fact that the inner core has an extremely high density and presumably its structure deviates from the conventional iron-nickel theory. According to the hypothesis of Dr. I. M. Belazarov, the inner core has a structure more akin to that of a neutron star. The outer core, on the other hand, is likely composed of nickel, iron, and other metal alloys. It is also hypothesized that similar structures exist in the cores of other planets in the solar system, including gas giants. The nature of this influence on Earth can be illustrated with an associative example of a flashlight beam in the dark. Imagine a concentrated beam of light surrounded by diffuse illumination. Based on the comprehensive analysis of all data, Earth is currently receiving only the diffuse part of the light. Observations of ongoing processes indicate that the planet has not yet encountered the concentrated beam, yet we are already witnessing a rapid increase in the number 
and intensity of catastrophes. According to mathematical models, this trend will only intensify. It is important to note that Earth has encountered this type of influence before. The geological history of our planet shows that Earth has repeatedly experienced similar phases of global climate and geodynamic changes of a synchronous nature. Geochronological studies of quaternary deposits, ice core samples, and evidence of large-scale extinctions, including human species, suggests that Earth has faced periods of sharp increases in large-scale climatic catastrophes approximately every 12,000 years. Additionally, every 24,000 years, planetary catastrophes were likely much stronger, as indicated by research on volcanic ash layers in ice cores and other geochronological studies. Researchers, such as Arushanov ML, V.B. Bubnenkov, A.M. Baturin, V.V. Bushwev, I.P. Kopolov, N.V. Petrov, E.G. Smotrin, Douglas Vogt, and many others have come to understand the cyclical nature of global cataclysms on Earth, with a period of approximately 12,000 to 13,000 years. According to the accumulated analysis of current data, humanity is now entering an active phase of this cycle. By the end of 2024, there may be an increase in volcanic activity caused by the rise of magma and the erosion of lithospheric plates by magmatic flows. This could lead to more frequent earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. This conclusion is based on the following observations. Geophysical and geodynamic parameters of the Earth underwent sharp changes in 1995 and 1998, resulting in an exponential trend in seismic activity and destabilization of the planet's interior. This indicates a buildup of energy and tension within the Earth's interior, as well as a geometric progression in the release of energy. The ocean and atmosphere respond to these processes in the Earth's interior with a delay, but their change patterns are already showing an exponential trend in the graphs. As a result of the anticipated changes, many cities and states may face significant destruction. Applying an exponential function to estimate the damage from climate-related disasters suggests that the global economy might struggle to compensate for the losses within the next four to six years, potentially leading to an economic crisis. Forecasts indicate that world business could collapse during this period. Mathematical modeling predicts that conditions on Earth could undergo substantial changes within the next 10 years. Based on this trend, it can be forecasted that the frequency of all other natural disasters worldwide will increase in the near future. Scientific evidence supports the inevitable progression of climate-related catastrophes and currently, there is nothing to prevent the escalation of these calamitous events. Solar flares already have the potential to disrupt satellite operations, underscoring the importance of preparing for potential technological issues. Forecasts suggest that significant changes could occur within the next four to six years, impacting the viability of many regions. 
According to the further development of the described model, critical events may occur that could lead to the complete destruction of our planet. Tectonophysical modeling has enabled us to explore a potential scenario for the further development of events up to the predicted point of no return. The processes currently observed in the Earth's interior are driven by anthropogenic factors and the overheating of the planet's core due to the influx of excess energy from space. The core is overheating the magma excessively, leading to the melting of the mantle and the pressure of magma on the Earth's crust. This pressure causes the crust to fracture, creating pathways for the release of deep magma. In previous catastrophic cycles occurring every 12,000 years, Species extinctions were observed. However, the planet managed these cycles without significant disruptions to the integrity of its systems. In this current cycle, characterized by more intense catastrophes due to the 24,000-year cycle, an additional factor threatens the existence of the planet as a habitable object. The contamination of the world's oceans with microplastics, which has disrupted its ability to transfer heat from the Earth's interior to the atmosphere. To effectively address this problem, there is a need for international cooperation among scientists who can pool their efforts and resources to develop and implement comprehensive measures to tackle climate change. Today, modern science is fragmented into narrow specialties and disciplines that do not interact with each other. Naturally, in such conditions of global disunity, it is impossible to comprehensively analyze and fully investigate this planetary threat. If conditions for open cooperation are created, scientists won't have to start from scratch, as there are already real developments and understandings of cause and effect relationships in this area. We need to act swiftly and wisely with the remaining time. We've already touched on the topic of earthquakes. I'm expressing not just my thoughts, but those of every rational person. God forbid we go through such an experience again. We cannot allow it to happen. No one on earth should endure something like that. You might wonder why we keep returning to this topic. In studying seismic activity, We've noticed that earthquakes have been behaving differently in recent decades. Their mechanism has changed. Since 1995, they've been occurring deeper and deeper. These types of earthquakes have been happening worldwide, including in Armenia. The map shows the density distribution of earthquakes in Armenia from 1970 to 2023. The data source is the International Seismological Center, ISC. Complete data is available only up to the end of 2022, as more recent data is still being processed by the ISC. In 2022, the total number of earthquakes of all magnitudes in Armenia was 2,261. There are quite a few large faults in Armenia, but not all of them are active. To determine which faults have been active in recent decades, let's look at the map. It is evident that earthquakes are localized along some of the faults, indicating their activity. Cities such as Spitak, Vanadzor, Gyumri, and Yerevan are located in the areas of active faults. The map highlights two areas with the highest density of events and maximum magnitudes. The first zone, Spitak Yumri, 
in the northern part of the country is associated with a fault near the city of Spitak. Examining this zone in more detail, we see a significant number of earthquakes of various magnitudes in 1988 through 1989. This includes the Spitak earthquake and its aftershocks. Following a period of relative quiet starting around 1997, the pattern changed, with an increase in earthquakes ranging from magnitudes of 3 to 4.7. Since 2020, there has been a sharp rise in the number of earthquakes, affecting both small and medium magnitudes. It is known that centers have been in place in the Gyumri and Spitak areas since early 1989, capable of detecting small magnitude earthquakes. The appearance of many small earthquakes since December 1988 is a result of the stress release following the major Spitak earthquake, with aftershocks potentially lasting around a year. In 2022, the number of small magnitude earthquakes up to three and medium magnitude earthquakes from three to five in this area became comparable to the number of aftershocks from the Spitak earthquake. There are no large mining enterprises or deposits in this region, so the occurring earthquakes are not related to human activity, but are a consequence of processes happening deep within the Earth. Currently, there is a steady increase in seismic noise, which is a different mechanism from the sudden stress release that caused the Spitak earthquake. The ongoing oscillations and minor tremors in Spitak are part of an overall increase in global seismic activity. Since 1998, there has been a change in the seismic regime, as evident in the depth distribution graph of earthquakes. This graph includes all earthquakes in Armenia, excluding quarry locations. Starting in 1998, isolated seismic events have turned into series of earthquakes at various depths. Two notable periods in terms of the number of earthquakes stand out. One, during the Spitak earthquake, and two, since 2020, there has been an increase in the number of shallow earthquakes. We have observed that such increases in earthquake depth occur at specific points worldwide. This may be related to the intensification of magmatic processes. We hypothesize that these earthquakes do not follow the conventional pattern of tectonic stress accumulation, but rather result from magmatic pressure on the Earth's crust. This is a protective mechanism of our planet. A series of earthquakes in the Earth's crust indicates that the crust itself compensates for the increased pressure of magma in the magmatic channel, thereby preventing volcanic eruptions. During a volcanic eruption, only part of the accumulated magma is released, while the remaining part undergoes a natural compensation process. This compensation process manifests as a series of stabilizing earthquakes of varying magnitudes which subsequently prevents the magma from erupting. Additionally, earthquakes in volcanic areas may be associated with the accumulation and penetration of large amounts of magmatic gases, both in and beneath the crust. This is another mechanism at play. In 2014, the region experienced highly unusual earthquakes at depths of up to 150 kilometers, which is within the mantle rather than the Earth's crust. This indicates that energy releases are now occurring in the mantle, something previously not observed in this region. We have already discussed the possible reasons for this activity. The trend of increasing earthquake depths is characteristic of the entire Caucasus region. This feature of growing earthquake depths has also been observed globally in recent times, with the number of deep focus earthquakes on the rise. We noticed that before the tragic earthquakes in Turkey and Syria in February 2023, there was an increase in deep focus earthquakes in this region. In the one to two years leading up to the event, there were more than 190 earthquakes at depths of up to 750 kilometers. Who knows what the increasing depth of earthquakes in the Caucasus might lead to, where our beloved Armenia is located. The second area of active seismicity in Armenia is in the south of the country, associated with the copper molybdenum mining sites of Kajaran and Agarok. We decided to investigate whether the earthquake activity here results from quarry blasts or from natural seismicity. In addition to the quarries, there are deep faults in the Earth's crust in this area, 
Determining the nature of shallow earthquakes in this zone definitely requires knowledge of the blasting schedules at the mining sites, which we do not have. Therefore, let's look at the earthquake depth graph. It shows that in 2018, earthquakes reached depths of more than 25 kilometers. Clearly, no surface operations could cause such seismicity. Moreover, this year coincides with an increase in seismic activity across Armenia. In the subsequent year, 2019, there were only two earthquakes in this zone, indicating that quarry blasts did not contribute to the graph. Since 2020, the graph shows a significant increase in seismic activity in this area. To eliminate any doubts, we excluded all events that could be related to quarry operations based on location and depth. The resulting data for all Armenia is presented in the graph. The number of earthquakes with a magnitude of 1, marked in red, and a magnitude of 2, marked in turquoise, has sharply increased since 2020. However, there were also many such earthquakes in 1988 to 1989 during the Spitak earthquake, indicating that the sensors necessary to detect earthquakes of magnitude 1 and higher were already in place at that time. These magnitudes are also visible in data from 2010. However, there has been a sudden and significant increase in the number of earthquakes of these magnitudes recently, indicating a change in the earthquake mechanism. In total, the number of earthquakes of various magnitudes in Armenia for 2021 and 2022 has already exceeded the number of earthquakes during the Spitak disaster and its aftershocks. If this trend continues, and there are no indications globally that it will stop, the number of earthquakes will continue to increase, and according to the Gutenberg-Richter law, their magnitudes will also rise. To confirm these statements, let's compare the seismic activity during the Spitak earthquake, which had a magnitude of 6.8, with the seismic activity for the same duration starting from 2020. A 3D model over time, depth, and magnitude distribution of earthquakes from 1988 to 1990 is presented. During this period, 2,689 earthquakes were recorded. In 2020 to 2022, there were 4,934 earthquakes in Armenia, nearly twice the number of recorded during the Spitak earthquake period. This clearly shows that the number of events has significantly increased, and they are occurring at greater depths. While it may not be noticeable in cities and villages that seismic activity is rising due to the absence of a major earthquake like Spitak, it seems that everything is calm. We might think that we will be spared this time. However, it is evident that a disaster is approaching. The current situation is much more serious than during the Spitak earthquake, the effects of which are still deeply felt. We might not fully grasp the gravity of the situation, but the facts show that we needed to consolidate the efforts of the world's best scientists around one table yesterday. We need to understand how this new earthquake mechanism works. We all see the risks and the real threat of daily disasters worldwide. Unfortunately, this will only escalate. No matter where you are on the globe, this concerns you directly. We believe this is the most important issue right now. We need to establish a unified scientific center to address this climate threat. The sooner we do this, the better. We need to act now. We need to understand the situation now. While we think maybe it won't happen, we're losing precious time. We all need to initiate a public demand, urging scientists to unite and urgently tackle the climate problem. If we start talking about climate issues, discussing them on social media, and asking questions to those responsible, we all have a chance to save our own lives and the lives of other people.
In studying the causes of climate change, our scientists have concluded that since 1995, processes have been occurring in the Earth's core that have affected the magnetic field. What is the magnetic field? What are the signs of its weakening? And how does it impact living organisms? The Earth's magnetic field is the planet's natural shield. It protects all living things from harmful cosmic and solar radiation. Without its magnetic field, Earth would not be able to support life as we know it. This field helps retain the atmosphere, facilitates chemical interactions, and enables the transmission of nerve impulses in living organisms. In his work, The Earth's Magnetic Field and the Human Body, esteemed scientist professor Nikolai Alexandrovich Agajanyan wrote, The origin of the geomagnetic field is mainly due to internal causes driven by processes occurring in the deep layers, core, shell, crust of the Earth and complex induction currents in them. The origin of a much smaller part of the geomagnetic field is related to external causes, among which the main role is played by currents in the ionosphere and magnetosphere. Modern theoretical works suggest that the main cause of occurrence of the geomagnetic field is vortex-like electric currents in the liquid core of the Earth. However, Since 1995, processes within the Earth's core have been affecting the magnetic field. Let's go back to the processes inside a planet. What has been happening on the planet since 1995? This year, a series of unprecedented changes began to occur in the magnetic field of the planet. The magnetic North Pole begins to drip rapidly at a rate four times the normal. At the same time, the magnetic field weakens 10 times faster than before. Weakening of the magnetic field is already affecting even the upper layers of the atmosphere, thus reducing their density and cooling them down. But that's not all of it. In 1995, simultaneously with the shift of the magnetic pole, the rotation axis of the planet sharply changed direction and began to move 17 times faster than before. Rotation axis of the planet started to change its trajectory. Look at the graph to the right. The blue circle here represents rotation axis as it used to be before 1995. The orange circles indicate the new trajectory, which shows that the rotation axis of the Earth is shifting sideways. At the same time, since 1995, one of the stages of unprecedented acceleration of the planet's rotation that occurs in leaps and bounds has been observed. Look at the yellow lines on the chart. They're trend lines that show how fast the day is getting shorter. For example, the left line is more gradual, while the right line, acceleration since 2016, is almost vertical. This means the length of a day is shortening much faster. What does this mean? That our planet is spinning up drastically, like a spinning top, and it's getting faster every time. So what are the causes of the changes in the magnetic field, the trajectory of the planet's axis of rotation, and the speed of rotation that began in 1995? Few people know about the real nuclear threat. The real nuclear threat is the nucleus, that is, the core of our planet. The core of our planet is an entire system that synchronizes and stabilizes all processes on Earth. It plays a pivotal role in the climate changes happening right now on our planet. Why? Because the rotation of the core forms the electromagnetic field and gravity, protects the atmosphere, and thus preserves the conditions for life on Earth. For a long time, the rotation of the core remained unchanged. But a few decades ago, the situation changed radically. 
All that you and I already know about the anomalies in the magnetic field and the Earth's rotation suggests that there has been a malfunction in the core itself. And this is a catastrophe. We, as inhabitants of the planet, do not feel these changes in the magnetic field. However, we can observe signs indicating these changes. What are these signs? They include red auroras and light pillars. We admire these phenomena without realizing their implications. Today, South Atlantic magnetic anomaly is growing due to the magnetic field weakening. Over last century, the intensity of the Earth's magnetic field has dropped by more than 10%. This means that a more powerful flow of cosmic radiation, such as ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma, and their derivative, is threatening us. This also means that an even greater flux of the external cosmic impact is penetrating towards the core. There is another sign of the changes in the Earth magnetic field which indicates the stabilization of the core and is probably unexpected for you. These are atypical auroras. You probably noticed that this year there are particularly many abnormally bright and frequent auroras in various non-typical places of the planet. People have posted numerous photos and videos on social network admiring this phenomena. However, unfortunately, there is isn't anything to admire, and now we will explain why. What is an aurora? This is the interaction of the solar wind with the Earth magnetic field and the atmosphere. In simple terms, the solar wind particles interact with oxygen and nitrogen, causing them to emit light, which we observe as an aurora. Depending on how deeply charged particles can penetrate the atmosphere, what energy they have, the auroras with different colors we will observe. Each altitude has its own color, which is determined by the composition and density of the atmosphere. On Earth, we used to see green auroras, mainly on the poles. Green auroras occurs at the height of 60 to 130 kilometers above the Earth. Then solar wind particles with a medium energy interact with atomic oxygen. However, the auroras also can be red. It occurs due to the interaction of high-energy solar wind particles with atomic oxygen. Usually, it appears at the heights above 130 miles because such high-energy particles were prevented by the magnetic field from penetrating below this altitude. Red auroras were rare. They occurred only during the intense magnetic storms. Now, we observe an extremely alarming anomaly. Not only red auroras become more frequent, they already been observed at the altitude lower than 55 miles. What does it mean? First of all, this means that the magnetic field is weakening and those active high energy particles of solar wind, which were supposed to be reflected from the, by the magnetic field, and they are freely penetrating deeper into the atmosphere and beginning to interact with atomic oxygen closer to the Earth. This is important to note that there is a penetration of larger, more highly charged particles that act more destructively. The fact that the red auroras occur in the lower layers of the atmosphere means that there are no longer protection above. The second reason why the auroras are behaving abnormally is the descent of the upper layer and middle layers of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is contracting it is sinking and the density of its upper and middle layers is decreasing. Moreover, its chemical composition is changing. Satellite data has revealed a decrease in the concentration of oxygen by two to four times at the altitudes of 80 miles. And the, rare, the rate of the oxygen loss is significantly exceed all predictive model, indicating some pathological process leading to a decrease in oxygen in the atmosphere. Scientists also record the destruction of ozone by solar wind at the altitudes of 50 miles, and soon we will see the ozone layer being destroyed in the stratosphere at the altitudes of 30 miles. This means that we will lose our protection from UV radiation. Red auroras are already appearing in mid-latitude. Many of these were observed in February 
and March 2023. On January 5th, 2023, the sky over Germany was colored red. This was example of anomalous static red aurora. In addition to anomalous red aurora, blue, teal, white, and even pink auroras have also been observed, which also indicate the penetration of solar wind closer to the surface of Earth and cracks in the magnetic field. During the solar flares, auroras are increasingly moving towards the equator. For example, during the strong magnetic storm on March 24, 2023, which scientists could not predict in advance and did not expect its arrival, the auroras was observed in the United States, even in southern regions, such as Virginia, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and in Arizona. Polar auroras started reaching southern latitudes in Europe, such as Czech Republic, Ukraine, and southern Russia. Unusual bright and frequent auroras, which now occur far from the polar region, cannot be explained by activity of the sun, as the sun is currently is in a prolonged minimum of its activity, meaning that the fewer particles from solar wind will reach the Earth. The only explanation for the aurora's anomalies is that the magnetic field is critically weakening, the atmosphere is contracting, and the solar wind is descending closer and closer to the surface. This is scary, because it shows a large disturbance in the magnetic field, and it is a sign that the Earth's core is no longer working properly. Few people know that there is another anomalous phenomenon that has become more frequent in the last few years. It is a logical manifestation of an atypical behavior of the magnetic field, which looks like light pillars. Previously, similar phenomena were observed only during the auroras, but now they start to occur even without them. Currently, these phenomena are mainly observed in cold regions at night when there's a light from street lamps. You can read that such light pillars appear because hexagonal or column shaped ice crystals are suspended in the air, one above another, and are illuminated by a light source. But recall night winter photos from 10 to 20 years ago. Did you see light pillars on them as often as you see them now? After all, there were street lights, but there were no pillars. What is now keeping the ice crystals in suspended state? This is not just an optical effect. Nowadays, there are more and more cases when light pillars appear in groups. They are brightly colored in the color of the street lights illuminating them. But the intensity of the pillar glows does not correspond to the brightness of the light source. And what is more abnormal is that light pillars with a red tint or color appeared independent of the light source. What are these light pillars? This is an atypical manifestation of the magnetic field properties, which cannot be detected by our instruments. It indicates a local weakening of the magnetic field. During such phenomena, cosmic radiation penetrates to the surface of the Earth along the magnetic field lines, interacts with the molecules in the air. This is what colors the pillars in different shades, similar to auroras. Ice crystals hang in suspended state along the power lines of the magnetic field. Today, you will learn what causes the local weakening of the magnetic field. Just as in the auroras, the red color in the light pillars indicate molecular oxygen, which we breathe, is being destroyed by harsh cosmic radiation. Molecular oxygen turns into atomic oxygen, which emits a reddish color, reddish light. This in turn, indicates that anomalous zones in the magnetic field are becoming more frequent and more extensive, and the power lines of magnetic field are distorted. As a consequence, our atmosphere is subjected to even more severe attacks from cosmic radiation. Now, you understand why such phenomena as light pillars are not at all fascinating, but rather, it's frightening. Our protective magnetic field is weakening severely. Harsh cosmic radiation is penetrating deeper and deeper into the Earth's surface, and oxygen in the atmosphere is depleting. All this is progressing extremely rapidly, and we, being intelligent and educated people, do not see that. We admire the anomalous polar lights, light pillars, and say, how beautiful. What can be beautiful about impending death? A typical anomalies in the magnetic field are terrifying and alarming phenomena, which is related to the destabilization of the core of our planet due to cosmic impact, 
which affects our planet once every 12,000 years. There are also phenomena in the magnetic field that directly affect the transmission of radio signals and the work of the Internet. This is the South Atlantic anomaly. NASA compares it to a dent in the Earth's magnetic field or a kind of pothole in space. Spacecraft passing directly through the anomaly while orbiting the Earth at low altitudes suffer from its effects. The fact is that satellites and the International Space Station receive a more intense exposure to charged particles from the Sun. High-energy protons from the Sun, due to the weakened magnetic field, impact the technological systems on board satellites, potentially disabling them. The following phenomena in the atmosphere are also extremely dangerous and are already causing fatalities. No one has yet linked these phenomena to the disruptions in the Earth's magnetic field. But right now, we will provide several examples to illustrate this type of anomaly. Anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field are now leading to another type of atmosphere phenomena that is extremely dangerous and is already causing the death of people. These phenomena are not yet being linked to disruption in the Earth's magnetic field. Specialists try to explain them in traditional ways. We will now give you several examples uh, uh, to, to illustrate this type of anomalies. Among the number of climate disasters that have been attacking the people of Saudi Arabia for the past six months, there was one circumstance that no one paid attention to. On December 29th, 2022, the temperature dropped abruptly in Mecca. However, it did not get cold around it. An area of coldness appeared locally and suddenly out of nowhere. This led to formation of powerful cloud system. Look how suddenly it appeared there and brought heavy rain and hail with it. After a while, the temperature returned to normal, so no one paid attention to this. These abnormal, sudden, and localized temperature drops are attempted to be explained, for example, by Arctic cyclones bringing the cold. But why didn't cyclone manifest itself along the way? Because when cyclone moves, it leaves a trail of cold behind it, cold behind it along this uh, entire trajectory. An Arctic cyclone cannot suddenly fall from above, make a cold snap in a local region, and disappear without a trace. Similar instantaneous localized drops in temperature have also been noticed in other parts of the world. For example, on December 21st, Colorado, USA, the temperature dropped by record-breaking 40 degrees Fahrenheit in just half an hour. And in the state of Wyoming, a weather station recorded an unprecedented drop of temperature of 20 degrees Fahrenheit in just two minutes. On February 3rd, in the United States, near the observatory of Mount Washington, the air temperature dropped sharply to minus 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Mount Washington is known for the world's worst weather, but February 3rd, the temperature drop was record-breaking. The combination of freezing temperature with hurricane winds gust up to 127 miles an hour, felt like minus 108 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature drop was so sudden that trees and soil exploded and cracked from the freezing water. If people on the mountain at that moment would have begotten frostbites within two minutes. Simultaneously with the temperature drop, there was a sharp drop in pressure. Meteorologists explain these extreme conditions by the partial drop of the stratosphere into the lower atmosphere. You can see the animation on the screen. Such sharp localized temperature drops are associated with another type of atypical magnetic anomalies, which have not yet been detected by our instruments. These anomalies appear as a result of disruption in ionization of atmosphere and molecules. Ionization it is important to understand that the charges of air molecules in the atmosphere are affected by the magnetic field. And in zones of atypical magnetic anomalies, the ionization of molecules in the atmosphere changes, and as a result, the connection between molecules weakens. Because of this, the air becomes less dense, and cold air from the upper layers of the atmosphere quickly descends to the Earth's surface, while the warm air rises into the stratosphere. This phenomenon can be called atmospheric contraction or overturns, which occur very quickly 
and half local character. This phenomenon can be detected by measuring the qualitative changes of molecules in the upper layers of the atmosphere. Probes can be placed in different parts of the planet to perform continuous measurements of the electrical charge on the air molecules, its intensity, and strength. Another manifestation of such zones with extreme low air density in the atmosphere has increased the incidence of clear air turbulence, where air pockets are formed without any apparent reason. This phenomenon is neither predicted nor detected by radar. Clear air turbulence occurs in clear skies or with minimal high-level clouds. Without obvious signs of turbulence, making it very difficult to detect in advance, both visually and with the help of radar. The American Geophysical Union, AGU, has provided evidence that turbulence is increasing. In the North Atlantic, clear air turbulence has dangerously increased by 55% since 1979. Janice Rachel Lachance, CEO and former vice president of the American Geophysical Union, linked this phenomenon to climate change and expressed concern. The frequency of severe turbulence is increasing and poses a serious safety threat. According to studies conducted by the National Transportation Safety Board, the Federal Aviation Administration reported 184 cases of serious injuries caused by turbulence between 2009 and 2023. On March 21, 2022, a China Eastern Airlines aircraft took off from Kunming Airport in China. After two hours of normal flight, the plane suddenly began to fall. In just two minutes, the aircraft plummeted seven kilometers. The captain attempted to avoid the crash and gain altitude, but in a split second, the plane turned 90 degrees and vertically crashed into the ground. You can see this now in the simulation. On March 11, 2024, a plane flying from Sydney to Auckland experienced what the airline called a severe jolt. Two hours into the flight, the plane suddenly dropped and began to fall sharply. There were 263 passengers and nine crew members on board the Boeing 787. Fortunately, the plane was able to regain altitude and land safely. 50 people were injured. In late May 2024, a flight from London to Singapore encountered severe turbulence. Unbuckled passengers were thrown into the air as the plane plummeted 54 meters in less than five seconds due to sudden changes in vertical speed. Within three minutes, the plane descended 1,830 meters. There were 211 passengers and 18 crew members on board. One elderly British man died and 85 people were injured. We have provided just a few examples. In all these cases, despite the absence of obvious external conditions, a sharp decrease in altitude was observed. Such air decompression phenomena, as well as atmospheric inversions, are associated with zones of atypical magnetic anomalies. One of these pathological zones is the Bermuda Triangle. From time to time, planes and ships disappear here due to magnetic field disturbances. In such zones, the adhesion between air molecules decreases, leading to the formation of air pockets. The air simply ceases to support aircraft. Moreover, water molecules in these zones behave similarly. The bonds between them weaken, and the water becomes so fluid that ships literally sink to the bottom without any mechanical damage. However, if previously we knew where atypical magnetic anomalies might occur, like in the case of the Bermuda Triangle, then now, such Bermuda Triangles are emerging more frequently and almost everywhere. There will be more turbulent pockets in the atmosphere, especially at altitudes of 8 kilometers and above. Where most commercial jets fly, these pockets are already reaching the ground and the time will come when there will be so many of them that flying and sailing will become impossible. It is indeed frightening. We must warn people. Unfortunately, in a consumer-oriented society, where human life is not valued, such anomalies are not properly studied. Moreover, they will remain silent about them until the last moment to avoid panic and not lose profits. 
How many airlines do you think would want to announce that flying is now dangerous? You know the answer yourself. Let's summarize. Due to a malfunction in the Earth's core caused by external cosmic impact, our planet's magnetic field undergoes catastrophic changes. Anomalous auroras, light pillars, atmospheric voids, turbulence anomalies, zones of extreme decrease in air and water density, as well as atmospheric overturns are observed. There is another indicator by which you can trace anomalies in the magnetic field, and that is changes in living organisms. All life on Earth, from humans to insects and bacteria, depends on the magnetic field. Therefore, any abnormal changes in the magnetic field affect their vital functions. In their scientific article, The Earth's Magnetic Field and the Human Body, Nikolai Alexandrovich Agajanyan and Irina Ilarionovna Makarova write, a possible reason for the connection between the dynamics of geomagnetic disturbances and the dysfunction of living organisms at various structural levels is the change in the magnetic and electrical properties of both intracellular and extracellular water, as well as the water molecules that make up cell membranes. It is known that increased geomagnetic activity has a direct damaging effect on biomembranes disrupting the transmembrane transport of water and ions. According to experiments, the biological effects of changes in magnetic fields on living organisms can be so severe that they are considered as dangerous as radiation. Magnetic fields influence the electrical conductivity in the liquid mediums within organisms. The more complex the organism, the more natural adaptive compensatory mechanisms it has, such as the nervous and immune systems, as well as liquid mediums. The smaller and simpler the organism, the less ability it has to survive changes in the Earth's magnetic field. We are now on the verge of a sixth mass extinction of species and many creatures are disappearing at an alarming rate. Even more disturbing is the fact that this was triggered not only by human activity, but also by magnetic field anomalies that have occurred over the past three decades. First of all, the smallest, simple species of the animal world get extinct because they cannot adapt to the sharp change in the magnetic field. But, unfortunately, this is just the beginning. Insects. In 2019, the Biological Conservation Journal published a study on the decline of 41% of insect species, with one-third of them already being endangered. In recent decades, 46% of bee species have become extinct. Bees use geomagnetic information to synchronize their biological clock, navigate in space, build honeycombs, queen cells, and so on. Scientists are sounding the alarm. The number of bees is decreasing, even in forests that remain untouched by human activity. This points to the influence of changes in the magnetic field. Many species of butterflies and moths have been significantly affected. In Britain, for example, their numbers fell by 58% between 2000 and 2009. Insect populations in protected areas of Germany have declined by 76% over the last 27 years. Similarly, the tropics of Puerto Rico have seen a decline of 78 to 98% in insect biomass over a period of 36 years. The decline in the number of insects has led to the extinction of birds, frogs, and lizards that fed on them. The mass extinction of insects will lead to an environmental disaster. The disappearance of even seemingly insignificant species like the mosquito will lead to a domino effect, ultimately leading to the gradual collapse of the entire complex system of the animal world. Frogs and amphibians. Over the past 20 to 40 years, due to changes in the global magnetic field, there has been a sharp decline in the number of populations of many species of amphibians around the world on an unprecedented scale. This phenomenon itself has attracted increased attention from scientists and caused great public concern, especially in North America. These disruptions lead not only to population declines, but also to mutations 
hermaphroditic individuals, and other pathologies. In the chemical analysis of water, all the parameters were within normal limits, indicating precisely the effect of changes in the magnetic field. In the large forest area of Bunderbos in the Netherlands, the population of salamanders has been steadily declining since 2008 for unknown reasons. By 2013, only 4% of their previous quantity remained. Changes in the magnetic field are also affecting freshwater crustaceans. According to studies, the weakening of the Earth's magnetic field leads to a decrease in the size of Daphnia zooplankton and slows down their reproduction. During migration, birds navigate using magnetic fields. A study of 2 million captures 152 land bird species in North America revealed a mass phenomenon of avian vagrancy when birds lost their sense of direction and deviated from their path due to geomagnetic disturbances. Anomalous zones not detectable by measuring devices. Recently, there have been cases where various species of migratory birds did not fly to their wintering grounds due to occurrences of magnetic anomalies, which are not detected by modern devices. Such anomalies are characterized by rarefied air, unnatural for bird flight. In 2020, hundreds of thousands of dead migratory birds were found in the southwestern United States. The birds were in good physical condition, except for extreme exhaustion. It was as if they got into a trap where some power was forcing them to fly until exhaustion, until they died. In recent decades, cases of whole flocks of birds falling dead for reasons unknown to ornithologists have been recorded all over the world. Frightening facts of further consequences of local magnetic field anomalies that are not detected by modern measuring devices are observed worldwide. These include sudden strandings of whales, dolphins, harbor seals, and crocodiles, cases of wild roe, deer, goats, and sheep going berserk without any registered source of disease have also been documented. Animals are dying, and scientists don't know why. Our Earth is gradually dying. Our flora and fauna are dying due to the cycle that causes all these changes. The smallest species are the first to die, then it will affect larger species. In the coming years, the number of undetectable magnetic anomalies associated with changes in the Earth's core will only increase. Right now, we have nothing to oppose these magnetic anomalies. We suggest that all specialists pay attention to the information presented here. As we have mentioned earlier, as of today, the Earth's magnetic field has weakened by 10%, and this trend is clearly increasing. As a result, we, humans, are becoming vulnerable to the effects of cosmic radiation. Therefore, we are currently observing a rapid growth in oncological, viral, and other types of diseases. This is an established fact that during the magnetic storms, there is a number of heart attacks and strokes, including fatal, fatal increases two to three times. This is because the charge of the magnetic field reduces the external charge of erythrocytes, which leads to their clumping. Blood coagulation increases by two and a half times, which significantly increases the risk of thrombosis. Let's look at the slides showing the rate of cardiovascular diseases, psychiatric disorders, and cancer, which are steadily increasing, and they are caused, among other reasons, by the changes in the magnetic field. These numbers are shocking. But I would like to point to another extremely disturbing fact related to our health which official science cannot explain. Many countries sounded the alarm. Young, healthy people have suddenly and prematurely started dying. Autopsy does not reveal any organic damage, no aneurysms, heart scars, blood clots, or ruptures of vessel. That was as if heart was simply switched off. This phenomenon was called sudden adult death syndrome. Doctors cannot find explanation for this phenomena and are discouraged by the number of cases occurring. There are several theories about what, how that could be caused, and you can see them on the screen now. But despite the funding and research in this area, the number of sudden deaths in the world continues to rise rapidly. And all these tell us that the cause lies in the processes that we are still don't know, and they are not known to official science, especially 
we are witnessing another type of atypical anomalies in the magnetic field, which arise from the changes in the core. This a drastic local increase in the magnetic field intensity that migrates across the surface of Earth. The human body, then exposed to such an area, simply shuts down. Its research situation, if, if it's not performed within two to three minutes, death will occur. Today, due to the increasing instability of the planet's core, this type of atypical anomaly is occurring more and more frequently in the various parts of the planet, which means that the amount of sudden deaths will continue to rise. This is impossible to shield against this phenomenon. In the coming years, this will become the new pandemic. What's happening with the climate today is terrifying. Dear viewers, we understand what you're feeling right now. We're also unsettled by what's happening, but we know there is a way out. We just need to get the information out to everyone and start solving this problem together. For the kaleidoscope of facts, we conducted a social survey and asked our fellow citizens, do you notice what's happening with the climate? Have you noticed that the number of climate-related disasters has been increasing lately? Lately, there has been an extraordinary number of climate disasters, and I feel that their number will only continue to grow. After all, the Bible also mentions that in the last days, there will be cataclysms. I know about the ozone hole and all that. Not in depth, but on a surface level, I know. No, I wouldn't say that any specific changes have caught my attention. Yes, I have noticed. For example, let's take rain. If it rains a lot during the day, it means we're doing something displeasing to God. Normally, it should be raining at night. That's the most primitive example. As far as I know, there are natural cycles, such as climatic phenomena, that don't really depend on human activity. This is normal, planetary cycle. The important thing is that no one can predict earthquakes with certainty maybe 1 or 2 percent accuracy at best. No one can fully predict hurricanes either, though you can track them via satellites. Yes, that's all. But the exact consequences are always unknown. We just need to be prepared for them, developing emergency response structures like the Ministry of Emergency Situations. In other words, we need to prepare, seriously prepare for disasters. That is our task. People are polluting the environment too much. As for climate disasters, I think earthquakes are the main concern in Armenia. That's what we need to be wary of. Did you know that there are potential volcanoes in Armenia? No. Volcanoes? Well, I figured that could be possible here but I hadn't really thought about any of them being potentially active. I don't think it would be a serious problem. A few dormant ones? I know about one. Aragats, right? Yeah, that's the one, right? Honestly, I've heard about it, but I kind of forgot. I think they mentioned Aragats if I'm not mistaken, but I could be wrong. It's interesting about volcanoes, but I wouldn't say I'm really informed. Potential volcanoes? As far as I remember, that's Aragats. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm right, but that's the only one I know about. Yes, I know. Whether they'll wake up, no one can say. And in reality, dormant volcanoes are everywhere. <laughs> In recent times, the active volcanic zone in Armenia, if I'm not mistaken, should be our Vardenis region, specifically the Vardenis mountain range. It can be said that this area is attributed to the most recent volcanism. I know the Garni Fault and the Spitek Fault. The Garni one is probably not even a fault, 
It's more like a caldera. That's very dangerous. On a global scale, there should definitely be some kind of center for studying climate phenomena. Do you know what to do during an earthquake? What should your first actions be? If you are at home, you should immediately pick up your documents and leave the building. Help children, the elderly, and parents avoid using the elevator and turn off electricity to prevent fires. It's easier to stay safe if you're outside. God forbid something like that happens. In my time, a lot of drills and training sessions were done in schools. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening now. The Ministry of Emergency Situations needs more scientific structures, more active young scientists who can push all of this forward. How do you think we can quickly spread accurate information about the climate so that everyone becomes aware? And in turn, create a public demand for establishing a unified scientific center? I think it might be possible to do this through social networks, like Instagram, VContact, or Telegram, by creating various communities. Maybe even start a YouTube channel to share videos or something similar on these topics. You know, right now is the golden time for spreading information. While we still have electric power, internet, and communication, we can inform everyone around us about what's happening. Informing people is a crucial step we cannot overlook. Only this way can we convey vital information to everyone. Only this way can we be heard by those who can help unite scientists from around the world. Once scientists understand what's happening, we'll have a chance for the future. Right now, it's in serious question. Despite the complexity of the situation, there is a solution, and you're about to learn about it. We're pleased to present an excerpt from the video address by Professor Egon Cholakian, a prominent American scientist of Armenian descent. Egon Cholakian is a qualified particle physicist collaborating with CERN's cutting-edge laboratory on the future circular collider technology and participating in NASA's NISAR mission. He has worked with four U.S. presidents and currently serves as a federal lobbyist in Congress and the White House. Professor Cholakian is recognized as an expert on climate change and national security. The esteemed Egan Chalakan has spoken on the topic of climate several times, and further, you will be presented with the excerpts of his two addresses. My name is Egan Chalakian. Today I have an urgent message for all of humanity that pertains to the fate of our civilization. I elected to bring this message to your esteemed attention following my recent participation in a joint Nobel Prize Committee National Academies of Science meeting in Washington, D.C., whereat we discussed the issues of misinformation and disinformation. This sparked a point in my life where I realized there is so much misleading information on the subject of climate change that inspired me to deliver the following message to you people. This matter is of utmost significance for the survival of every living being on this planet. My qualifications attest to my competence to make a decisive statement regarding climate change on our planet. It is evident that the Earth is experiencing a rapid escalation of extreme climatic and geodynamic events. There is a significant rise in the occurrence and magnitude of seismic, volcanic, hydrological, atmospheric, gravitational, and thermal anomalies. Furthermore, we have recently detected a number of alarming anomalies in all the layers of the Earth's system. 
There is an extraordinary displacement and destabilization of Earth's core, a sporadic and chaotic acceleration of the planet's rotation, and a shift in its rotational axis. This scenario is compounded by a critical weakening and emergence of atypical anomalies of the magnetic field and a change in the composition of the upper layers of the atmosphere. These events have culminated in an extreme activation of magnetic foci and an accompanying increase in deep mantle earthquakes, a decrease in the thermal conductivity of the ocean. As a consequential result, our oceans have lost their ability to function as a compensatory and cooling mechanism. All these alarming factors indicate only one thing, to wit, our planet is on the verge of self-destruction, and humanity only has a few years remaining to avert this impending catastrophe. Right now, our planet is entering a cycle of climatic disasters that affects all the planets of our solar system. This entire solar system undergoes this cycle every 12,000 years, and every 24,000 years, the cycle has its highest intensity. Similar to Earth, evidence processes of change in the cores of other planets and geodynamic restructurings, as well as the increase of atmospheric anomalies, are occurring elsewhere within our solar system. This, in turn, would suggest that these cycles are caused by the influence of an external cosmic impact on all the planets of the solar system. Now let's talk about volcanoes. This portion of my presentation will be centered on the cataclysmic volcano activity, both historical and forthcoming, and on the impact likely to be visited upon mankind. Whether viewed through the national security or national disaster lens, the threat warrants immediate global attention. Accordingly, from the introductory presentation, it is hoped that a blueprint to address this issue at hand may ultimately be born. The enhanced frequency of extraordinary geophysical events indicates pronounced instability in the Earth's core. This same instability will consequently manifest itself in the form of intense heat and subsequent magma, as witnessed just a few weeks back. The seismic events unfolding before us today should not be overlooked or discounted. Earthquakes realized in Turkey and Syria compounded by a succession of volcanic eruptions and subordinated activity ought to provide ample warning of imminent danger at our doorsteps. Should an earthquake occur in a geospecific region of China or elsewhere on the planet that produces a force magnitude similar to that recently visited upon Turkey, such an extraordinary event could actually trigger volcanic activity as far away as Yellowstone Caldera, located in North America. Volcanic networks are indeed incestuous in all respects. If this were to happen, the consequences could be devastating, potentially resulting in a consequential eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano. Moreover, such a catastrophic incident could also activate an interconnected network of volcanoes worldwide. In this latter-most scenario, the fate of mankind would likely be at stake. Volcanoes erupt when mandatory conditions are met. Currently, an increase in magnetic activity is observed on the Earth's interior, and this will ultimately bring about enhanced volcanic activity from both volcanoes and supervolcanoes alike. As magma escapes to the surface, even if external impact on the Earth's core were fully arrested, the presence of inertia would suggest that the eruptions would persist. This inspires the inevitable question as to whether or not volcanic eruptions could be controlled, regulated, or even precluded by man. Can we actually diffuse volcanic eruptions? The eruption of a volcano is instigated by the ascent of magma and the buildup of pressure within the conduit of the volcano. Upon reaching the surface, the magma is discharged as a result of degassing. The process of eruption is also accompanied by a series of small earthquakes that cause the surrounding plates to shift, which can influence the upward movement of the magma. In fact, volcanoes function as a remediating mechanism for our planet, with the goal of stabilizing magmatic outflows. What about earthquakes? Earthquakes are not a mere consequence of plate destruction, but rather a fundamental mechanism of natural remediation, a protective mechanism for our planet. 
A series of earthquakes within the Earth's crust indicates that the crust of our planet itself compensates for an increase in pressure of magma in the trowel, thereby adverting volcanic eruptions. During the eruption, only a portion of the accumulated magma is spent, with the remaining balance falling subject to the natural remediation process. The same process manifests in an integral series of stabilizing earthquakes of varying magnitudes, which further serves to stay magma escape. Such a mechanism of natural compensation does not, however, apply in the case of supervolcanoes. A supervolcano possesses a massive magma chamber embedded in the Earth's crust, where magma can ascend and penetrate through the tectonic plate, resulting in a volcanic eruption. Unlike regular volcanoes, Earth's crust is unable to manipulate the re and restrain the powerful supervolcano eruption through the movement of its plates. Instead, the tectonic plate succumbs to its elimination through a process of melting, uh, which allows magma to flow less impaired directly from the magma chamber under enormous pressure. In the present moment, we have an unprecedented opportunity to avert such catastrophes. These are not fanciful theories, but rather fundamental principles that are being implemented today. We have acquired the knowledge of how to properly degas and unload volcanoes. By implementing a controlled preemptive degassing strategy, we conceivably could harness the potential of alienating the buildup of pressure in supervolcanoes, thus preventing magma from burning through the Earth's crust and thereby averting the catastrophic consequences of a supervolcanic eruption. To properly perform degassing measures and activate the compensatory mechanisms already in place, it would be necessary to control both the plates and the pressure of magma in order to regulate closure of the trowel. By carefully controlling the processes, we could release the growing pathological tension in the areas most influencing the lithospheric plates, thereby reducing the frequency of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. In other words, the process of earthquakes can be influenced and possibly regulated. We can prevent the catastrophic eruptions of a supervolcano. However, this can only be achieved after we stop the external impact on the core, which takes place every 12,000 year cycle. This is an undeniable fact. If we fail to take corrective action or improperly conduct degassing, the excess energy will intensify the cavitation process of magma and lead to a sharp expansion of magma pressure which the crust would not be able to withstand. In such a case, our planet may well face the same fate as Phaphon, a catastrophic explosion that would transform it into an asteroid belt. And in due course, I realized that any comprehensive understanding of such a complex and sophisticated subject would likely require an intimate interface within not only the geophysical and astrophysical domains, but a variety of other specialized scientific domains as well. The problem of the scientific world, which is supposed to solve such issues, is that this academic world is divided. Everything is studied within the narrow confines of a specific discipline. Whereas the question of synchronous and nominalist destabilization of all the Earth's layers and the associated risk of imminent destruction of our planet can only be investigated with the use of a global interdisciplinary approach. Some scientists and policymakers argue against disseminating information about the severity of the situation to avoid causing panic and destabilizing society. However, such an approach can be dangerous and it hinders the search for practical solutions to this problem. It's akin to a situation where a patient has a disease and refuses to go to the doctor, hoping for self-healing. In such cases, the risk of the patient's death significantly increases. Therefore, an open and objective dialogue among all interested parties is essential to choose the optimal strategy for saving humanity from a global catastrophe. However, what has the global community been preoccupied with regarding addressing climate issues? We're still collecting funds to combat the rise in CO2 concentrations, which is in fact a compensatory mechanism during the 12,000 year cycle of catastrophes. 
It's the result of ocean warming that leads to CO2 emissions. The subsequent natural step in compensating for the heat rise within the planet is the activation of volcanoes. This is a natural process. We urgently need to establish a unified international scientific center, essentially an international interdisciplinary alliance of the world's best scientists who will work on solving this problem. We need a fruitful collaboration of specialists from various fields of science, such as particle physics, astrophysics, neutrino astrophysics, planetary science, climatology, atmospheric physics, oceanography, ecology, paleoclimatology, geophysics, seismology, volcanology, geology, hydrogeology, glaciology, creology, atmospheric chemistry, magnetostratigraphy, earth physics, geodynamics, tectonics, geomechanics, and much, much more. We need the brightest minds of this world capable of thinking unconventionally and innovatively. We need people who are ready to collaborate and to act in the interest of all humanity. The prompt creation of a unified international research center and its immediate launch into active operation is crucial for successfully accomplishing our vital task. I emphasize that any delay in coordinating and forming a unified scientific group critically reduces the likelihood of achieving this necessary result. I call upon all interested parties to act promptly and effectively to ensure the best conditions for our collaborative research aimed at saving all of humanity. Dear colleagues, friends, today I, Egon Shalakian, address you with the most important and urgent call in the history of humanity. I want to reach out to all scientists of the world, those who can distinguish truth from falsehood, those who literally understand what is happening to our planet. Those who know about the real threat of climate collapse, yet also see the prospects for the future of humanity. I address those who have dedicated their lives to science and practice, and those unafraid to seek the truth. I implore you to unite for the sake of saving the future of all of humanity, your lives and the lives of your children and grandchildren. I also want to address all people, every person in the world. Today, I, Egon Shalakian, address you not as representatives of different nations, religions, or political forces, but as a united humanity, as fellow citizens living on one unique and vulnerable planet. I urge you to support the creation of a unified international scientific research center and to support the leaders of your countries in endorsing this international initiative. This is not just a project, it is our shared responsibility and our chances for survival. We cannot afford to waste time on conflicts, disputes, and divisions. We cannot afford to ignore facts, evidence, and warnings. We cannot afford to be indifferent to the fate of humanity and to each of one of us. We must change the world and for that, as a society, we need to mature in the shortest time possible. It's now time for collaboration, not competition. Thank you very much, Professor Chalakian. Yes, friends, only together can we create conditions that will mitigate and eventually stop climate disasters ensuring a safe future for us and future generations. We, humans, have a task that impacts not just our fate, but our lives. This task has many unknowns, but still it is solvable. We already have technologies that can help address the main issues of climate change, ocean cleaning, energy, clean drinking water, and consequently food supply. We invite you to watch videos about these technologies. In recent years, 
we have observed an abnormal increase in seismic activity. Not only is the number of earthquakes rising, but their intensity, meaning magnitude, is also increasing. These earthquakes are happening both on land and on the ocean floor. At the same time, there's a rapid rise in deep focus earthquakes, which trigger earthquakes in the Earth's crust. Therefore, predicting and preventing destructive earthquakes is a critical challenge that humanity will need to tackle in the coming years. Since the mid-20th century, significant research has been conducted on the consequences of human-induced impacts on the Earth's crust. This has led to the idea of exchanging a major earthquake for a series of smaller ones, which would help relieve overall seismic energy. For example, scientists from the Institute of Physics of the Earth have analyzed data on induced seismicity, meaning earthquakes caused by human activities. These activities include the creation of large reservoirs, oil and gas extraction, mining of solid minerals, underground nuclear tests, powerful electrical impulses, and the launch of large rockets. Powerful engineering activities also impact seismic processes. As a result, they found that these anthropogenic influences affect the seismicity of the regions where they occur. It was discovered that in areas affected by these activities, the number of minor earthquakes increases while the number of major earthquakes decreases. This led to the idea of relieving stress in tectonic plates through active interventions in the Earth's crust, in areas predicted to experience strong earthquakes, based on medium-term forecasts. For example, by relieving tectonic plates with a controlled explosion, instead of a major earthquake of seven or more on the Richter scale, there can be an earthquake of only 2 to 2.5 in the same area which would minimize damage to buildings and pose no threat to people. In a location where an earthquake is expected, drilling a well and using a controlled explosion at great depths could loosen stressed structures, thereby reducing tension and weakening the plates. However, to achieve this, our scientists need to identify the key primary indicators, which six months in advance will allow them to pinpoint the exact location magnitude of the earthquake and relieve the pressure. As early as 1952, scientists experimentally discovered a previously unknown property of newly formed surfaces of solid materials. They emit high energy electrons in a vacuum. When a rupture surface is created, it generates an electric field with a strength of up to 10 million volts per centimeter, capable of causing electron emission. This discovery later led to the identification of hard X-ray radiation from these surfaces, which has been utilized for non-destructive testing of material strength. In particular, for identifying early microcracks that do not yet lead to failure. When a solid material reaches a state close to fracturing, the developing lens-shaped cavities become sites for the emission of electrons and X-rays, which can be detected. Similar processes occur in the Earth's crust about a month before an earthquake, particularly in areas of maximum lithospheric plate interaction. There, various particles, including endogenous neutrinos, are released in large quantities. The flow of endogenous neutrinos interacts locally with the Earth's electromagnetic field, disrupting its lines of force and kind of turning it into a sieve. The resulting holes, due to neutrino activity, create conditions that allow cosmic radiation to reach the Earth's surface, as recorded by Polish scientists. Polish geophysicists compared data from several cosmic particle detectors with seismic activity and concluded that strong earthquakes are preceded by locally measured anomalous fluctuations in the background cosmic radiation reaching Earth, observed approximately two weeks before potential tremors. This increased particle flux can be detected with portable detectors that scientists are already using. 
Another option is to use a neutrino power cube, a fuel-free generator that uses graphene to convert the kinetic energy of particles into electricity. An increase in its power output would indicate a rise in the particle flux, meaning such devices could serve as sensors for endogenous neutrinos. By deploying these devices globally, real-time information on where and when earthquakes might occur could be obtained. Currently, we can only rely on primary indicators of earthquakes, such as increased neutrino emissions in the area where an earthquake is about to take place. However, the problem is that when there is significant emission of endogenous neutrinos, it becomes impossible to carry out such stress relief, as this could result in an earthquake exceeding 10 on the Richter scale, meaning 20% stronger instead of the intended 7 to 8. This can be easily explained with a simple example. Imagine a locomotive pushing a long train of cars up against a concrete wall. As the locomotive continues to push, the pressure builds up between the first car and the wall. Eventually, something will give under, either the car or the wall. And what we call an earthquake occurs. Now, imagine that the pressure has built up to a critical level and is being transferred through all the cars to the locomotive. If you suddenly remove the first car that's between the wall and the rest of the train, a gap forms. At that moment, the stress peaks. What happens? Many would say the spring starts to release. There's a powerful impact because a huge mass collides at an abruptly increased speed. This results in a stronger impact force, which is the mass multiplied by the speed. But what happens if the first car at the back of the train is removed, meaning the one furthest from the locomotive? A gap forms between the force pushing the cars and the cars themselves. The cars are on an incline, and the locomotive is pushing them uphill. The load on the plate decreases sharply, damping the stress. How does this happen? When you remove a car, the locomotive can move faster. But now it faces the full mass of the remaining cars and their load. This mass moves toward the locomotive. What will happen? First. There's a reduction in pressure between the first car and the wall. And second, the mass of the remaining cars quickly slows down and reduces the force pushing the cars, which in turn slows down the locomotive. Thanks to neutrino sensors, we can pinpoint local areas where there are high concentrations of these particles. These areas can be thousands of kilometers away from the predicted earthquake. By identifying where the stress is building up, we can relieve the pressure on the tectonic plates before cosmic radiation even becomes a factor. As a result, we would experience only minor earthquakes, up to a magnitude of 2.5, and avoid a major seismic event both at the relief point and the forecasted site. In this way, with the development of these sensors and installations, we can monitor nearly the entire globe for any changes and effectively manage almost any earthquake by relieving the stress, thus preventing the problem. This could make seismic activity entirely manageable. However, a significant hurdle remains, the fragmentation of our society. To implement such technologies, international cooperation and collaboration are essential. The exponential increase in deep focus earthquakes and volcanic eruptions indicates unusual magmatic activity within our planet. Volcanologists are also observing anomalies in the composition of lava ejected by volcanoes. This composition is atypical and characteristic of magma from deep mantle layers. It is hotter and more fluid, which accelerates its ascent. The rapid rise of magma from great depths indicates the emergence of dangerous and previously unobserved processes inside the Earth. This means that a huge amount of energy is beginning to accumulate in the planet's interior, seeking to escape. Supervolcanoes that have been dormant for thousands of years are starting to awaken. Given the dynamics of these changes, 
There is a possibility that the explosion of one supervolcano could trigger a chain reaction of volcanic eruptions, leading to a global catastrophe. Can we influence these processes and mitigate their destructive consequences? Yes, if we understand the physics of the process. A volcanic eruption occurs due to the rise of magma from the magma chamber and the increase in pressure within the volcanic conduit. The behavior of molten magma in the magma chamber is similar to that of yeast dough. The magma expands, occupying all available space and rises from the depths of the earth through cracks, trying to escape. Just as dough lifts the lid of a pot and overflows, magma breaks through the earth's crust at its weakest points and erupts to the surface. This is what we call a volcanic eruption. Volcanic eruptions occur due to the degassing of magma. The process of degassing is familiar to everyone. When you carefully open a bottle of a carbonated drink, there's a pop and a bit of smoke and sometimes foam comes out as the gas escapes from the drink. This is degassing. If you shake or heat the bottle before opening it, a powerful stream will burst out and you can't stop the process. If the bottle isn't tightly closed, this stream can blow the cap off by itself. Magma in the magma chamber is under pressure, much like carbonated drinks in a closed bottle. Where the Earth's crust is loosely sealed, magma can erupt from the depths, blowing out the cork of the volcano. The stronger the cork, the more powerful the volcanic eruption will be. Therefore, scientists are seriously concerned about the activation of ancient calderas because they pose a serious threat to human life. They are also concerned about finding ways to prevent volcanic eruptions. Mukherjee Tichayan, Oleg Albertovich, and his colleagues propose managing pressure in secondary magma sources under volcanoes that exhibit sulfateric activity, emitting hot gases and steam. They propose this approach to prevent volcanic eruptions and utilize magma as a building material. It is suggested to drill inclined channels into a secondary magma source and use certain manipulations to divert the magma. As a result, the magma pressure should decrease, preventing an eruption. However, this mechanism will not work with supervolcanoes. In the case of a regular volcano eruption, only a portion of the accumulated magma is expelled. The remaining magma undergoes a natural compensation process through a series of stabilizing earthquakes of varying magnitudes, which then helps to prevent further magma from escaping. Unlike regular volcanoes, in the event of a powerful supervolcano eruption, the Earth's crust cannot contain it through the movement of tectonic plates. Instead, the tectonic plate undergoes destruction due to the melting process, allowing magma to flow under immense pressure directly from the magma chamber. If a supervolcano caldera erupts, it will result in a massive release of magma, energy, and everything else, causing a sharp drop in pressure inside our planet. This will trigger a phenomenon where all the magma inside will boil. Its temperature and volume will instantly increase several times, similar to what happens if you open the lid of a pressure cooker without first releasing the pressure. Since the calderas of supervolcanoes are interconnected by magma flows that are under immense pressure, other volcanoes will also erupt like corks from bottles. These magma flows are constantly circulating, forming magma rivers, which are the source of the pressure. Pressure builds up in the chamber, formed under any caldera directly connected to this river. This magma river washes the plates, constantly eroding them from below more and more, and eroding passages for itself upwards. When magma from the chamber beneath the supervolcano rises and burns through the lithosphere, it is a sign of an imminent eruption. Unlike a regular volcano, the magma chamber of a supervolcano is enormous. Therefore, a different approach is needed here. Which one exactly? To prevent an eruption and a major catastrophe, it is necessary to relieve the excess pressure, that is, to dega. This can be achieved by making a hole and releasing the excess pressure. 
If this is done in the same caldera, its stability will be disrupted, thus activating it. However, since all calderas are connected by magma rivers, drilling should be done elsewhere. This location can be easily determined using satellite systems and thermal imaging to study our planet. Having found the most suitable place, it is necessary to smoothly dump excess gas by drilling. At the same time, we will need to release a lot of lava in that place. However, as a result, we will avoid an explosion, both at the drilling site and in the caldera itself. This must be a carefully controlled process. With such planned unloading, the bubbles that form in front of the supervolcanoes are released. This means that the pressure drops not only in this magma chamber, but also in the one connected to it through magma rivers. The cooled magma forms very dense and strong surface compounds. Thanks to these, the volcano will not erupt for the next millennia. The first step to take is to fully transition to atmospheric water generators and stop drawing water from the surface and underground sources. Atmospheric water generators can produce sufficient amounts of water needed for both drinking and industrial purposes. They will be of vital importance in conditions of water crisis and will ensure the sustainability of the water supply. The second step is to reconstruct sewage systems. Water must not be discharged into open water bodies. It should be directed into the soil purified, and only after undergoing natural final purification through soil layers should it reach water bodies. Extracting water from the atmosphere by 70% solves the problem of exacerbating climatic phenomena, whereas wastewater treatment solves it by another 30%. This will enable several of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to be fully achieved at once. The third important step is the introduction of fuel-free generators, FFGs, which, due to their energy intensity, are needed to provide atmospheric water generators with the necessary and affordable energy. Moisture for water generation systems must be replenished from natural sources, and this requires the elimination of open reservoirs. It is the introduction of FFGs that will reduce dependence on hydroelectric power and will allow dams to be opened. Restoring rivers to their original channels and revival of their natural flows will eliminate stagnant water and revitalize ecosystems. These measures will also make it possible to achieve a number of the sustainable development goals adopted by the UN General Assembly. These are the priority steps towards saving the planet. If they are implemented, we will see tangible results within two to three years. Atmospheric water generators extract excess moisture from the atmosphere, which accumulates due to the rising temperatures on the planet. During the air intake process, pollutants are filtered out, resulting in cleaner air. AWG technology is environmentally friendly and beneficial for the planet. Can AWG technology produce water in the required amount? Even if 8 billion people take 100 liters of water from the moisture, there will be enough evaporation to refill that. And this is what we should be looking to doing. And it is clean, right? And it is uh, available everywhere to everyone. And so I think suddenly the world has woken up to this alternate source. I designed and developed the technology to a place where I can build an atmospheric water generator that could produce over 100,000 liters a day, 200,000 liters a day. It's not, it's not difficult anymore. You just have to think about it long enough. So my goal with this technology is, is to allow people to be able to live wherever they would like to live and never have to worry about water scarcity. Because as long as you can breathe, as long as you're pulling in air, there is moisture in that air. We've created larger systems to where if you wanted to, you can make thousands of gallons per day, but you're just using that much more power to where it comes a conversation of, okay, do we want to have a higher capex for buying more machines or a higher opex to keep them running? Atmospheric water generators can produce any required amount of water, including for industrial needs. AWG technology can revolutionize the existing principles of agriculture and become a necessary element in almost all production cycles. Atmospheric water generator technology is vital for everyone's survival, but it has a weak point, energy consumption. 
Manufacturers are scratching their heads on how to make their systems more cost-effective and economically rational. They install solar panels on them. This works for small atmospheric water generators, but on an industrial scale during periods of global climate change, this solution is not efficient enough and sometimes too vulnerable. We need an alternative, powerful, environmentally friendly, and most importantly, inexpensive source of energy. Fuel Free Generator, or FFG, can produce unlimited amounts of safe and cheap electrical energy, significantly reducing our costs. This device converts into electricity the energies that are already present around us in unlimited quantities. For hundreds of years, many attempts to integrate such devices into our daily lives have been unsuccessful due to the artificial suppression of scientific and technological development. Today, there are many models of FFGs in the world, based on various principles and converting different forms of energy into electricity. These technologies have the potential to radically change the life of society and become accessible to everyone, including you. In October 2023, an international congress on free energy was held in Switzerland, where developers from various countries shared years of experience and demonstrated their inventions. The advantages we have over conventional renewable energies are rather simple. This is a base load capable renewable energy because it is available 24-7, 365 days a year. In this context, it is important that the basic costs become significantly lower because the entire maintenance, transport costs, provisioning costs, and grid costs for energy simply do not apply. Therefore, energy in the future, if intelligently controlled, meaning even lower consumption, can be significantly cheaper. And I believe by then we will have achieved a great deal for the consumer. We can offer them reliable energy that is not at risk. That means means there is no supply security issue, that power suddenly goes out due to natural disasters. They always have it, and it is secured at an affordable price. And if we can contribute a part to that, then I have fulfilled my mission. As you can see, friends, we have all the chances to tackle the challenges of our time. But we can only do this together. First and foremost, we need to inform everyone about the problem and its solutions. We don't have much time. The next four to six years will be relatively stable. And every person's actions matter greatly right now. Our future is in our hands. And it's up to us to shape it. So, dear friends, let's sum it up. After receiving this information, we hope you now understand the terrible threat looming over all of us. Due to the increase in climate disasters, we could lose everything. Our homes, our loved ones, even our lives. A catastrophe could happen to any of us at any moment. It doesn't matter if you live in Armenia or any other country. If we continue to do nothing, soon there will be no safe places left on planet Earth. Today, our most pressing issue is the exponentially increasing climate disasters. This means they will worsen every day because they are caused by a 12,000-year cycle we are currently experiencing. During our conference, you may have noticed a sense of denial about this information in your mind. This is because you didn't see a way out. However, as we have already explained, there are solutions to these problems. Therefore, it is crucial for us to stop denying the obvious and instead focus our attention on solving this issue. A very important step is that we now know the truth about what is happening with the climate. It is also necessary to understand that we have the freedom of choice. We can leave everything as it is, accept what is happening, and simply wait for the end. Or we can find the strength within ourselves to resist climate change. And no matter how impossible it may sound, what can ordinary people do against the climate? Everything actually depends on the choices and decisions of people.
The power of people lies in our unity around a common goal. In this case, it is vital for us to come together to address the climate issue if we want to ensure a future for ourselves, our children, and our loved ones. The task before us today is global. It cannot be solved in just one country. It can only be solved by the whole world working together. And we Armenians can set an example of unity for all nations. We are known for such admirable human qualities as friendliness, understanding towards others, and a willingness to help. Owing to these qualities, Armenians can be seen as the conscience of humanity. And what, if not conscience, drives a person or an entire nation to take actions that help save lives and preserve the future of humanity? We are also aided by the fact that Armenians are spread across the globe. About three million Armenians live in our native Armenia, while around 10 million live in other countries. This global presence will help us unite. The issue of climate change requires the attention of every single person on the planet. Only then can we solve it. With our extensive experience in interacting with other cultures, we are uniquely positioned to find common ground both among ourselves and with people of other nationalities, playing a crucial role in uniting humanity. We must understand and convey to others that if we, the people of this planet, do not unite in the coming years, climate disasters will overtake us all, regardless of where we live, whether in Armenia or another country. While we still have time, we must do everything in our power to save our planet and our lives. It is crucial to understand that we have four to six years to address the climate issue and stabilize the geodynamic, hydro, and atmospheric processes on our planet. In these times, people need to forget about their selfishness. If we remain selfish, thinking only about ourselves and behaving like animals in constant competition, none of us will be able to survive. We remember the tragic experience of the Spitak earthquake, but we also remember our experience of helping one another, of caring for the lives of others. This defines a person who strives to help others and support the whole society. Being a true human and helping others is inherent in each of us when our best human qualities come to the fore. And now, we know where to apply these qualities. We live in a unique time, experiencing an event that happens only once every 12,000 years. Moreover, our cycle is more complex than previous ones, because we have begun doing something unprecedented, producing plastic. As a result, we have polluted the ocean, which now fails to function properly. Evidence of this includes numerous hurricanes and typhoons, severe rainstorms, sudden landslides and sinkholes, and terrible floods worldwide that destroy our homes and take thousands of lives. We see this in many countries, including our own Yerevan. An overheated ocean, unable to dissipate heat, accelerates the demise of our planet and us along with it. But on the other hand, this very crisis could propel us into swift action. There's a saying, a man won't cross himself until he hears thunder. Well, the thunder is already roaring, both literally and figuratively. 
Half the world is sinking, and the other half is shaking. It's time for us to wake up, dear Armenians, and start taking action. Yes, we live in challenging times. But it is precisely in such times that evolutionary changes can occur for our planet and all of humanity. We can become the main initiators of these changes. If we don't wait for disaster to strike but start acting now for our salvation, channeling our efforts and our accumulated experience of mutual aid and care, towards preventing climate catastrophes, then together, united, we can change everything. Today there are already scientists who have been studying climate change for many years and have developed strategies to save our planet. It is crucial for us to unite the best scientists in the world for further study and research in this field and to find effective solutions. This must be an interdisciplinary group of scientists so they can combine their accumulated experience and knowledge from different scientific fields. Our role is to create the best possible conditions for their work and provide all the necessary resources, because their work will require access to various territories in different countries and laboratories across the globe. And it is vital to facilitate this without prolonged governmental approvals given the time constraints and the importance of every human life. We can achieve this by utilizing the tools available in our society today. According to the constitutions of all countries, the bearer of power in any nation is the people. Politicians and those to whom we have delegated authority to address public issues depend on our opinions and act according to the will of the people. But how can they start addressing climate issues if we, the people, are not talking about it? Therefore, it is crucial for us to create public demand for politicians and those responsible for making such important decisions to establish a unified scientific center to tackle climate issues. You might be wondering, what can I do to create such public demand? Here are some simple steps that each of us can take. First, educate yourself about what is happening with the climate. Take an interest in the geological structure of our planet, the events occurring in your area, neighboring regions, countries, and across the globe. Second, once you understand it yourself, share this knowledge with others. You can do this when meeting friends and acquaintances, talking with colleagues and neighbors, or through social media. It's important to make climate a main topic of discussion. Third, in conversations, on social media, and whenever possible, demand action on this issue from competent people, namely scientists. Advocate for the creation of a unified scientific center to address climate issues. Set an example for others to follow. Together, through our collective actions, we will create an information field in both Armenia and other countries where Armenians reside. We can engage with people of other nationalities, and this information will spread worldwide. In this way, we Armenians can play a leading role in saving humanity. We will have something to be proud of. Just imagine, in a few years, you will be able to tell your children and grandchildren how you recognize the danger threatening humanity.
made the right choice and decided to help unite people and address climate issues. As a result, you and your children, loved ones, and close friends will have a chance for a future. It is certainly worth the effort to take an honest look at what is happening outside your window and start talking about the climate. If each of us does nothing today, there will be no future for us or our children. Whether we like it or not, we live in times of change. This era could mark the end of our human community, or it could be the beginning of a new and wonderful world. What it becomes depends on the choices each of us makes. By addressing the climate issue, we will see the tremendous opportunities that come from unity. And then, if we choose, we can direct the collective potential of all 8 billion people towards improving the conditions of our society and realizing each person's dream of creating a world where everyone is happy. We, the volunteers of the Creative Society Project, dream of establishing a unified civilization where human life is of the highest value. In this world, all of us, citizens of the world, will have equal rights. We will preserve our cultural heritage and democratic values. We will be able to move freely around the globe, much like the current freedom of movement within the Schengen area. In this society, there will be no wars, crime, or conflicts, and all resources will be accessible to everyone. Each country will maintain its uniqueness, yet the world will become one. The Creative Society Project Program a monthly universal basic income equivalent to 10,000 US dollars for every adult, a one-time payment for childbirth and monthly payments for children, privately owned spacious and comfortable free housing with a minimum area of 650 square feet, 60 square meters, per person, high quality health care worldwide, free of charge, high-quality education anywhere in the world, free of charge, four-hour workdays, four workdays a week, with equally high salaries worldwide for identical positions, specialties, and professions. Paid vacations of no less than 30 calendar days at least twice a year. A safe world without wars, conflicts, crime, and corruption. Guaranteed economic stability. No inflation, economic defaults, or crises. Stable fixed prices worldwide. No taxes for individuals, small and medium-sized businesses. Cancellation of all debts and loans, including mortgages. Visa-free travel and unrestricted movement worldwide while preserving the territorial integrity and borders of countries, as well as the cultural and religious heritage of nations. Advancements in cutting-edge technologies that improve human life accessible to everyone in any part of the world. But that is our next step, which we will take after overcoming the most serious challenge of our time, the climate crisis.